Good evening. Welcome to the November 15th, 2012, the inaugural meeting of the Northampton City Council under the new protocols of the newly established city charter. I am City Councilor Large Bill Dwight, and as the Council President, I will be presiding over this and future meetings. Phew. Um, Mayor Narkowitz is in the audience tonight, and he will uh, be presenting financial orders under the new rules, uh, which we will elaborate on during the course of, the, of tonight's meeting. Uh, but first, it's time we set aside to uh, hear from the public, and anyone is invited to speak on any topic for three minutes. There is a timer that will indicate the time uh, once it's expired, and I ask that you please respect that. Uh, Councilors, by their rules, may not respond, so please consider that when you address the council. And first up, we have Mike Kirby. Hi, Mike Kirby, 134 North Street. Um, I am going to probably exceed the three minutes. Please don't. What? Please don't. I will. Um, I guess I'm speaking tonight for, for the people down at McDonald House, many of the people down at the McDonald House. I have this letter here that I like to read. And I don't know who this woman is. I know her name, but I've never met her. But I think she represents a lot the, the average person there. To the city of Northampton, we don't hate the monk Sanama, Samana. He just won't leave us alone. He follows us. He, pry, he pries into our affairs. He embarrasses us. I feel that he causes havoc on the elderly. He has announced on the radio about our tenant union vice president and how others of us are all bad people. He embarrasses us in public. He has harassed and spoken bad verbal words. He has lately played on a piano in our community room some sad and cult music, never pretty, or enjoyable music. At the farmer's market, he gets some food to bring to 49 Old South Street to feed the needy. We are not eating needy. The same way with bread and bagels. They are day old and all dried out. Overall, we want peace. That's all we ask. Most of us don't want to be friends with him. Why should we do as he commands? Why doesn't he follow the tenant regulations in the building like everyone else? Most of us are weak and scared and embarrassed. We just want to live free from harshness. He can be friendly to us, but he should not command us. Where are our rights and protections that are supposed to be here for us? The protections for our disabled, sensitive, the fragile, the weak, the old, the young. Please listen to us. I have been there. I have put my own mother and aunt in nursing homes. How very sad it was for them to be in these places where they were afraid to talk, where they were harassed and abused for their disability and their sickness. It's starting to feel like that here. I want to be in a safe, friendly housing with privacy and fun get-togethers, gatherings where you feel comfortable. You can grow old in a place where we call home, have our own independence and our own lives, not going by his ways and means. Michael, we know it is no fun to be disabled or to grow old. Do you have much more on that? Please listen to us. Like they say, help the elderly, help the poor, don't be disloyal to us, be a friend, sincerely a tenant. It is time for the city of Northampton to read the Globe on its series on public housing and understand the cost of political appointees. The executive director of the Michael Michael you were the, in excess of the, the executive minutes. director of the Northampton Housing Authority had no experience when he came on board 
He has somebody that's a social worker, full-time social worker. He hasn't been around for weeks on end. I went to find him. Michael. He was, uh, he was at home. Michael, please. In his pajamas and bathrobe. Michael, please. At 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry. I'm One sorry. more minute. That you. And then I'll go and sit down, okay? I mean, a lot of times we played this game for years on end. People complain to the mayor, he says, it's not my responsibility. Complain to the housing authority, nothing happens. It's time for the city of Northampton to step up like they did with the post of the economic development coordinator, go outside if necessary, and find an executive director with experience managing professional management of houses. He's got 703 units on. Okay, Michael, that's in excess of the minute that you, you promised, and okay, I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Thank you. That's a nice start. Um, the next up is Jasper, Jasper Lapinski. My name is Jasper Lapiensky from Ward 3, um, and I'm starting to sound like a broken record here at Public Comment, aren't I? You see my green shirt and you roll your eyes. I wonder what this kid's going to talk about. Could you plow the bike trail, please? Um, in tonight's episode, street acceptance. Three streets are on the agenda tonight, and dozens more are in the works. What is street acceptance? It is the process by which privately held roads are acquired by the city for the sole purpose of shifting the cost of maintenance, like plowing, to the taxpayer. My question is this. If we have enough money to plow Valley Road, enough trucks to plow Hillcrest Drive, and enough personnel to plow Center Court, why can't we find the resources to plow two-thirds of a mile of rail trail, which is already accepted by the city, and which, by the way, gets a whole lot more traffic than all three of these private ways combined. I already know the answer, of course, political will. But I actually think we have a really valuable opportunity here, the chance to turn campaign rhetoric into governance, the thing that people write about in books and it goes in the fiction section. When our mayor ran for office along, posing alongside his bicycle, it's not as if he made some sort of campaign pledge to cyclists that he must now fulfill. In this case, if it happens, he will be going even further, beyond doing what he said he'd do, to being who he said he was. David, get it done. Thank you, Jasper. Is there anyone else? We don't, that's the only two people. Joyce? And, and please identify yourself from me. Uh, Joyce Saban, Russia, 67 West Street. Um, it's still never another death month, because <laughs> it's the month of November. and. This week, earlier this week, Massachusetts made um, an unusual record. We're the top state in the United States for admissions to emergency rooms for heroin addiction. We still are gravely short on our detoxes and our detox beds, and we still don't have one in New Hampshire County. Haven't won the lottery yet, so I haven't built it, but I'm really going to petition in Boston that they help us out because Hampshire and Hamden really need a large detox. Thanks. Thank you, George. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Well, that will close uh, the public comment period and move on to the roll call. Councilor Adams? Here. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Here. Councilor Navarre. Present. Councilor Murphy. Councilor Spector. Here. Councilor Schwartz. Here. Councilor Tacey. Here. And next up is the approval of minutes of November 1st. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? One. One abstention. Council here. Um, do we have proclamations? No. 
No proclamations, no resolutions, awards. We're up to one minute announcements. Any counselors have anything? Yeah. To Councilor to Casey <coughs> said yep. uh, that he was asked by Tommy P. Oh, sure. Yeah, a couple. Uh, the uh, city council is uh, cordially invited to the POWMI. A remembrance uh, ceremony at the Michael F. Curtin Post, uh, 18 Meadow Street in Florence, at 1 p.m. on Sunday, November 18th. Um, and any of you that would like to speak at this ceremony, you're welcome to speak. I think everybody has the invitation uh, in their packet, and um, it's always a very, it's a, it's usually it's, it's a moving, it's a moving remembrance, and um, we'd appreciate if you, if you at all could attend, it would be deeply appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, and one more thing here, I, I just, the, I know we're not going to have a meeting until after this, but the parking on Black Friday, I'm kind of opposed to uh, the city passing out parking tickets on Black Friday. I, I think it's, uh, I don't think it's the right move. It's not the right message to send to our businesses. Um, we need to do everything we can to help them out. And I'm not convinced that the revenue uh, generated is going to be it's just my opinion that I just don't think it's also supposed to happen on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve and on New Year's Eve we know we have our uh, first night and a lot of activities start for kids and things at 12 o'clock oh, um, excuse me Councilor Tacey it's just that um, on the announcements or announcements not lobbying for a, a okay. transition because I think that uh, since it's not on the agenda it would be inappropriate to deliberate that's uh, my only caution but I understand okay. but that's my opinion um, I don't think it's a good idea any other one-minute announcements? Uh, Councilor Schwartz. Uh, I want to take my minute uh, to acknowledge the tragic death of Palav Parak, uh, which occurred on Halloween in the inter-crosswalk uh, between Pulaski Park and crossing between Pulaski Park and New South Street. Um, he died crossing that street, got hit by a truck, and. Um, just passed away last in the last couple of days from his injuries. And I want to say that the Transportation and Parking Commission is meeting at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, the 20th, here, the City Council Chambers, where the issue of this crosswalk will be on the agenda. And um, I will be there, and so will some uh, residents of Ward 4. And it has been a subject of tremendous email traffic by dozens of constituents. Um, so it is something that I, I look forward to immediately paying attention to and just want to make sure that everyone is aware that that commission meeting is happening where it will be addressed. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. The uh, Walter Salva House will be having its Thanksgiving dinner Tuesday, 5 p.m. Tickets are thirteen fifty for people who don't live at the Walter Salva House. It's a Thanksgiving dinner with mashed potatoes and peas, and to cater to fair, it's usually quite good. And uh, if you want to get tickets, you have to go down to the Salvo House and uh, to the office. Thank you. Any other announcements, Councilor Labarge? Yeah, I I just want to thank um, Starlight Center, Councilor Tacey and I. Um, went to it for their Thanksgiving dinner yesterday, and it was a pleasure attending that Thanksgiving dinner with them. And I know, Councilor, you could not make it because you were busy. Thank you. Councilor Spector. Um, just want to announce that at the JFK Middle School on um, Thursday the 29th, there'll be a, a special City Council DPW public forum that will deal with uh, sewer and wastewater treatment. Um, and so that will be 7 o'clock JFK at the uh, community room. Councilor Carney. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank Councilor Labarge for uh, delivering flowers to the city clerk's office on behalf of the city council that expressed our sincere thanks for the amount of work uh, uh, city clerk Wendy Maza and the entire team over at the clerk's office did in an enormously um, a huge turnout of an election here in Northampton. And thank you, yeah. Councilor LaBarge. I just wanted to expand on what Councilor Schwartz said about this crosswalk. I, I, I requested that it go on the agenda because it has been a hot spot for years and years and years. And anybody, I encourage anybody that's had any experience with that crosswalk to please attend and, and chime in. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely important, that crosswalk that gets you to Pulaski Park on New South Street. Um, thank you very much. 
Any other announcements? I'm going to beg the council. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Dan. It's not during the announcements, but I'd, I'd like to be recognized out of order at some point. Sure. Anytime. <laughs> well, why not? Let's do the whole. I'm actually going to ask the council's indulgence at this point because we are now under the auspices of the new charter, as, as is evident to some people who are, who are expecting to see a much better dressed man sitting here. Um, <laughs> and uh, as, as the presiding officer, the, as of the certification of the election, the new charter stands. And it should be pointed out, the charter was voted by 85 percent margin, uh, which is a significant endorsement by the <coughs> <mayor. coughs> The um, I'm going to ask that we move out of order the presentation from the city solicitor so they can bring it up front so that we can navigate this. I mean, I think well, my obligation and I think all of our obligation is to make this work as seamlessly as possible. There's clearly going, we're going to trip and stumble. We're going to discover things that are surprises. We're going to run into some aspects that are confusion. But I would like to start off, if we could, if, towards the beginning of the agenda, at least having some clarity. So um, I would ask that uh, if, if you have no objections, would you mind having this moved up? Motion to <coughs> second it. See you all up. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, and so uh, we'll consider that a recognition of uh, the city solicitor, Alan Seawall. Alan, make your case. Um, I've already made my case, and the, <laughs> and the voters bought it. And, um, so um, thank you, uh, Mr. Council President. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've submitted a, a memorandum to the council, to the council president, and I'm sure, and I know that it was circulated, and I. I try to uh, clarify in the memo, although lawyers are not usually uh, here to clarify, uh, but in this case I'm, I'm hopeful that I can clarify any questions you have. Um, there are a few things, just a couple of things in the charter that the, the council needs to deal with sort of in the short term, and I've set those forth in the second paragraph of my memo. Uh, uh, appointing a committee to review and prepare revisions to the city's ordinances. So um, that should be among the first orders of business for the council because the charter requires it to be done uh, immediately. Um, within 180 days from the, uh, the uh, effective date of the charter, which was when the, the vote was certified, um, the council must enact an ordinance establishing an elected official co compensation advisory board. That, too, is set forth very specifically on uh, when to do that, and, it, and so I have uh, suggested that that be something that you attend to at least begin a discussion on how you will, um, you will fill out that, uh, how you will uh, proceed with that bylaw or ordinance. Um, there are certain changes uh, that the, the Charter has brought that really don't have sort of the timeline. Um, for those things, um, uh, my view is that we ought to um, invoke the, the charter as much as we can, as soon as we can. This is the will of the voters. Our old charter is gone. Our new charter is in place. And we ought to um, bring every provision forward as quickly as possible. Um, for instance, tonight we have uh, the council president presiding over the council meetings. Um, when I read the charter, one of the, the, the major effects of the charter that really doesn't have any timelines is changing this form of the structure of government and moving the mayor out of the legislative branch of, of our government. And so the, there are a few other things that I list in my memo that ought to be done sooner rather than later in order to effectuate the, the will of the voters that we separate these two branches of government. Um, moving the mayor off of the two committees that I found that the mayor is on, the council committees, um, is something that ought to, ought to happen. Revising the council rules so as to be consistent with the charter is something that ought to happen in the, in the short term. Um, and um, um, so those are the things that I have uh, suggested to the council that, that you as a body get started on. Um, to the extent that time is needed to do any of these things, the council and the mayor have the, the authority to uh, enact clarifying measures. 
that will clarify exactly how the, the, uh, the, uh, the charter will be implemented um, over the course of time. And the power to clarify ends five years from the effective date. So you do have some leeway um, to, to, do, uh, to implement the charter in a way that um, makes sure that there's no disruption of, uh, of city government and that, uh, that this is uh, effectuated as smoothly and seamlessly as possible. As uh, President Dwight said, there will be bumps along the way, and, and as issues arise, we'll have to deal with them and, um, and apply the charter. But those are the things that, when I reviewed the charter, when I reviewed your rules, when I reviewed the ordinances, those are the things that jumped out at me as the things that ought to happen um, sooner rather than later. Council Spector. Um, just on the third bullet here, in terms of, <coughs> oh, yes. in terms of um, removing the mayor from the two committees, the Finance mm -hmm. Committee and uh, Economic Development, that doesn't mean the mayor can't come to those meetings. He oh, just no, would no, not no, no, be no. a sitting member. He could still, could he even still be the, <coughs> the facilitator of those meetings, or do we have our own chair, uh, elect a chairperson for that committee? My view of this is that the, that the, the essence of our new charter is to separate. It's clear in our charter that we have a separate legislative and executive right. branches, um, and uh, they ought to be separated. Uh, the one thing the mayor did, did uh, remind me that he didn't uh, reiterate was the election of a, a vice president uh, to serve out until the uh, uh, a vice president is elected after the 2013 municipal election. But just to clarify, that, that separation does not include that the mayor can't sit on as a non-voting member on those committees. The charter doesn't say anything about the mayor sitting on council. Because we have non-voting members on, on EDLU the, right now. Um, as as uh, you might note, I, I said it would be appropriate for the mayor to be removed as um, from these committees that the, or, the ordinances uh, place him on. Um, there's nothing in the charter that requires any of that other than a separation, a general separation okay. of powers. Councilor Adams and Councilor Carly and Councilor Freeman Daniels. Um, in the in the four-person committee that's going to review the ordinances, the four persons are, are they are they councilors, non-councilors, or some combination? Is it silent on? Doesn't <laughs> say. Okay. And just the other thing I just want to point out to the council is that one of the recommendations is to. Um, amend certain of the council rules in dealing with the mayor's role. So I just wanted the council to know that um, since the vote last week, the, the, the proposal that I, the, the set of proposals, uh, the proposed changes that I have come up with, I've, I've amended those to change that language and, and address that the, the presiding officer will no be, longer be the mayor as, as long as all the other proposals that are up for consideration. Mm -hmm. Councilor Carney and then Councilor Kim. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a follow up to Councilor Spector's question and actually uh, also to Councilor Adams' clarification. Mm -hmm. um, the example I think of is the school committee mm -hmm. for which the mayor serves as the chair, even though he's not a member of the school committee and has no vote on the school committee. So I, I wonder then if there is some presumption that's made that the mayor, uh, by virtue of this charter vote, is um, removed as a member or even uh, precluded from chairing in the same way that the mayor presently chairs in another body <coughs> for which he's not a member nor a voting member. So I'm inclined to think that this charter doesn't make that change. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that's just my thought reading it because present practice, whereas we have separate elected bodies of a school committee, we also have the presence of the mayor as not only a member but as the presiding member over that body. The school committee. Um, uh, the school committee is not a legislative body in the way that this is a legislative body, so there is not that, that distinct separation. I would also point out that the charter does provide for the mayor to to sit as the chair of the school committee and, just, and, and specifically remove the mayor from that position here on the council. Uh, that to me suggests, um, you know, uh, the effect is that the mayor should not be participating in the legislative functions of this body. Um, that's my read. Councilor Freeman Daniels, and then Councilor Labarge, and then Councilor Schwartz. What she said. Oh, 
Okay. <coughs> Council LaBarge? Yes. Um, Attorney Seewald, you are asking us to elect a council vice president tonight. Why the rush? Well, because um, that is, because if President Dwight is not available, um, that is how the the charter envisions the uh, the presiding officer to. Uh, that's the devolution of the presiding officer to a vice president. Um, at this point, um, I would expect that if uh, without a vice president, uh, you would have to elect a presiding officer for the purpose of the meeting uh, that that uh, President Dwight was not. Would two weeks make a difference? Um, not at all. Thank you. Not to me, in, anyway. Um. Uh, Council, Councilor Schwartz and then Councilor Carney. Uh, my question was along Councilor Barge line, like whether or not we had, it, it would seem that we'd have the flexibility, and I'm glad you, your interpretation is such to have a couple weeks at minimum to have all councilors present, so it's. Exactly. Perfect full decision-making process. Well, let, let me just say that the only thing that, that the uh, the charter says about the vice president is that you will elect one after each municipal election, after each city election, you will elect a, a president and a vice president. Um, so after the 2013 city election, you will have to do that. And so my suggestion is that it would be appropriate to do that for in the interim until after the 2013 city election. Okay, I, I go back to my previous questions just because um, I understand that that's your interpretation that the intent of the charter change is to remove the mayor from the legislative uh, functions of the body. Uh, however, um, I see some of our subcommittees as not necessarily legislative, whereas they're kind of uh, bo deliberative bodies where. Um, recommendations may be made and forwarded to this then legislative body that makes an ultimate decision. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I agree that um, the, the charter change that removes the mayor as the presiding officer of this body means then that the mayor is not only no longer a member of, mm -hmm. say, Finance Committee, Ed Lou, or the things, but even no longer. I would say that it, um, it's certainly a stretch to say that the mayor would not be a member, and somewhat of a stretch to say would be precluded from even presiding over some of those. Uh, and again, that's just my opinion based from reading. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. So I'll say this <coughs> less rudely this time. Um, I concur with Councilor Carney. Um, I don't think this is really, I think we've heard from the solicitor on this. Um, the solicitor is clearly recommending. Um, that we that the council remove the mayor as a voting member, um, but it's there are committees, right? Uh, so we can set we can. It seems to me we can uh, declare the the mayor as an ex officio voting member of any council committee that we want to establish, uh, and <clears throat> I think this goes hand in glove with the fact that we really should look at all of the committees uh, and how effective they are at uh, at the deliberation of important matters in city government. And uh, I would hope that uh, those were those would be ordinances that would be reviewed by this four-person body as well. And um, I don't think there's any rush uh, because other than really uh, the fact that the council really can't compel the mayor to serve on any committee. Uh, council Spector and then Council Tacey. Yeah, I, on this four-person committee, I would hope that. Um, who's ever on it would invite m members of the uh, who wrote the charter and had the discussions whether this came up because I think intent is a, a big point here I don't remember if this was a, a point that came up in the discussions about the mayor serving or not but I would like to hear from them because if it was then the intent was there and I think we need to honor that if not I think the same thing I agree with you mm -hmm. but I, I would want to find out what what was behind this um, and, and was there anything that that you saw from the from the charter committee that was indicating these, or th that's your read of what the intent of the overall uh, charter is, to make the separation as clean as possible. I did not uh, solicit the, the view of the committee. Fine. I just read the You're language right. okay. of the charter and, and understood it to mean that, that the legislative branch would exercise legislative functions and appoint its committees, so, and the mayor would be 
executive. So can I go back to my first question then after you've answered this, which, which is, in your opinion, could the mayor sit on these committees, even preside over the committees, but not be a voting member of the committee? Would you, th just in your opinion now, do you think that's not enough of a separation? Is that what you're saying? I don't think there's any prohibition in the in the charter to, to uh, however, the, the mayor and the, the council with the, uh, okay. with the mayor want to set it up. I don't think no. there's any, anything specifically prohibiting it. I was just following through on that, sep that the principle of separation. Great. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jason and Councilor Carney. <clears throat> so I, I, with our new charter, um, I understand this is going to be a daunting task. We watched for two years as they put this all together and it finally came to a head. And so now here we are. Um, it has passed by 85 percent, as our president has told us last week. And now we have a clear and concise document but it's really not that clear and that concise. It's something that we have to build on from this point because there's a lot of things that have been left out. So as we build, and I know we're going to make mistakes, we're going to screw up and things are going to be changed back and forth. I, once we pass something in it, it, for this charter, how difficult will it be for us to change something if we do? Um, there are, uh, this is all new ground for all of us. So there are a few methods of of, cha of of establishing and changing a charter. One of them is the process we went through with this charter, which is to request a special act of the legislature that would probably be uh, the uh, most expeditious route to changing the charter. And and I, I have no doubt that over the course of time and experience, there will be some tweaks needed in the charter. Um, that that's very common, um, but. Uh, let me say that compared to our old charter, this is crystal clear. Yeah. And, and my, my, my point is that um, we could maybe kick an issue around maybe a lot, and I've seen it happen so many times in, in the legislation that uh, we kick things, or not us, but any legislation will kick things around so much that absolutely nothing gets done. I'm hoping that we, we can pull this together as quickly as possible. Um, but I do agree with Council Labarge saying that uh, there, I don't see the big uh, rush in the vice president election at this point. The, the key is for the transition to be smooth and seamless, and uh, there's no requirement that you that you uh, elect a vice president today or two weeks from now. Uh, it just is appropriate to do so that if uh, so, that we have a, a succession of presiding officers. Councilor Carney, then Councilor Barge, and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Um, I guess this goes back to I, we've obviously made a presumption right now <laughs> by having two empty seats at the table. I the know. two um, member, uh, two folks who were regularly at these meetings and sitting, the mayor and the finance director, are somehow prohibited. And so I, what my question is, is, and I'm hoping that the body will consider discussing this tonight, I do not see our count, uh, the charter change as um, prohibiting the mayor from being, nor compelling the mayor from attending this meeting. But um, it's my understanding that it would be a wise practice for us as a body to invite the mayor to participate to as full an extent as possible as would ease informationally and in many other ways, and to that extent to make a, a ready seat available with the placard that already exists. <laughs> so obviously we would want to have a chair that's sitting in the um, obviously central seat, but um, we would have the opportunity then to very easily forward questions to the mayor or finance director as we have in the past because there are so many items that come across our desk that do require some information from the mayor. That's just um, my sense of this now. We've acted, I think we've made a presumption that uh, both the mayor and finance director are no longer here at this table and I would hope that we can make some steps soon to certainly invite those members back to the table. Councilor Barge, and then Councilor Freeman. I want to. I have great concerns, and I want to echo what Councilor Carney had just stated. I was really shocked tonight not to see that our financial director was not sitting here, and I have to agree. 
I mean, we need to look at this very, very carefully because a lot of issues do come up in finance. And who do we ask? Who are we going to ask questions to? So that's my concern. So I'm hoping we can look at this very carefully because I feel the same way you do, Counselor. I think w something needs to be done here. Section 2-7C uh, two, two provides a uh, process for accessing information from the mayor. And that's the way mm -hmm. this council as a body accesses information from the mayor under the new charter. Um, the mayor, uh, does, and, and my experience in other cities where the, uh, a member of the council is presiding over the, the meeting, the mayor is not sitting at the table, nor is the finance director. Uh, this is a, they, they, they're just separate bodies. Uh, there's, an, there's separate branches. And um, just as the council doesn't go sit in the mayor's office, the mayor doesn't sit in the council's office. Uh, Councilor King Daniels and Councilor Adams and Councilor Spector. Thank you. Um, two things. I, uh, I agree that it is uh, awkward to have the mayor sitting in the audience, but from my perspective, it's just because the chairs are much less cushy out there. <laughs> uh, so so I, I think that we should allow the mayor to sit uh, at, the, at the council desks uh, would require a suspension of Rule 47 for tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's really important. I, obviously, I was a detractor from the charter this council cannot compel the mayor to sit in any seat. That's right. uh, the council cannot even compel the mayor to show up at these meetings. We can, we can ask with written, uh, with a, with a written note, f uh, seven days ahead of time for the mayor to answer questions. But the mayor does not have to attend. The mayor can send a representative. Um, so, so I think I think the separation is is uh, important. And and um, the other piece is that I. Uh, I don't understand why we wouldn't move on the vice president. Uh, it's simply a matter of succession. Uh, the, the, the day that we, I think the day that we uh, first convene the new council, we vote on the president. Um, so, you know, that could easily not have uh, a member there. The member could be on vacation because it's like January 2nd or something like that. And a lot of people go away that time of year, number one, number two. Uh, if President Dwight isn't here in two weeks, there is no succession uh, arrangement, and uh, you know I, he's. You look at him; he's a rock. You know he'll, he'll probably be here no matter what. But it's certainly possible, uh, and we have enough chaos right now trying to figure out this chart. I don't know why we would not move on vice, on the election of the vice president tonight. Uh, just it's um, it's just like how the mayor, uh, if the mayor's not there, the council president steps in here. If the council president's not here, we don't have any rules. No, nothing. Uh, we don't have a changed council rule, so there's actually no good uh, way in which I think we can possibly elect the president pro tem. But um, you know, I think that uh, we have um, we should move on the vice president tonight. So th those are my those are my two points. Councilor Adams, and then Councilor. <clears throat> With respect to the point about um, the solicitor's point about get accessing information from the mayor and the new charter provision two seven um, for the council's consideration, one of the things I've added since last week's vote to pass the charter was an agenda item specifically for that purpose. So the mayor would probably want to be present because one of the agenda items, if it passes, if the council likes my proposition and wants to pass it, would it would be an opportunity as a specific agenda item on every meeting to ask the administration f for information that the administration, the mayor, could provide at future meetings. That's a different agenda item. So um, that proposed council rule might um, alleviate the concern that well, the, the hope that the mayor would be available for information if the council chooses to adopt that rule that's going to be proposed. Council Spector, then Council Adams. Yeah, just a couple points on the mayor sitting <clears throat> here. Number one, we, uh, just the cameras probably haven't panned the audience, but the mayor and the finance director are here tonight. And um, we have other city folks coming in and presenting to us, and we recognize them. We have a DPW often coming in who have his information we need. We have the planning board coming in. I actually disagreed when the charter committee was having had two meetings specifically about the issue of who would chair the meeting. And I disagreed with the final result, which was I thought the mayor should continue to chair the meeting. However, it was very clear to me that the intent here was that the mayor, that the separation, 
that the attorney is talking about, it was very clear from those discussions that they wanted that separation. That's what that meeting was about. And I think in, to honor that in the charter, it was one of the biggest changes in the charter. You know, we had a two big changes. I agree with you, there'll be a lot of things. There really aren't that many big changes. I think this is one of them. And again, I disagreed with it, but I think the intent of it was to have as clear a separation as possible. So I don't see it as onerous to have, and if we, you know, I would be fine if we end up with the chair there. I think this is the kind of discussion that can take place in that committee of four. I think we ought to have people from the charter committee who wrote it come there so that we hear these kind of things and hear what, where they came from in their argument. Because I know a lot of the public heard these, these arguments, and that's, that's how it felt. Um, Councilor Carney, you're next, but can I sure. beg your indulgence for a second? Um, just, sure. uh, just by way of explanation, sure. that uh, um, I am, we are currently under the existing council rules, which actually constrain me from participating in the debate. Um, we abide by Robert's rules, and at some point, possibly, is my hope that we may consider modifying that. But um, I should say that what I'm, I have, um, trying to assemble a transition team to address these specific issues as we're going to try to address them and then hopefully have at least some some order, uh, orderly uh, review of these yeah. points, uh, taking these issues into consideration, coming into uh, in for the future meetings and if, uh, have something in place at some level by the next meeting so that we can figure out rules of conduct, Rules of procedure, protocols relative to uh, committees and committee assignments, and uh, who presides, who doesn't preside, order of ascendancy, things like that. Those are kind of important issues that, that actually come to us. So, uh, Councilor Carney. Thank you. And I just want to clarify some uh, statements that were made earlier about the um, uh, lack of process right now in the council rules. Should the council president, for some reason, um, be indisposed and not present at the meeting. And mm -hmm. right now, our council rules that um, provide for the mayor and then the council president, I'll just remind folks in section six, in the case of a vacancy or in the absence of the mayor, the president of the city council shall preside. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we are now with the new charter. At a duly called meeting of the city council when both the mayor and president, president are absent. So I think that would be in that case when council president would be indisposed. The city council may elect by majority vote a president pro tempore mm -hmm. who shall preside for that meeting and shall retain voting privileges. So presently, we do, you know, should mm -hmm. Councillor Dwight suddenly become ill <laughs> even during this meeting, we have the opportunity as a body to an, to an elect uh, someone to take over the meeting from that point forward. I, I do see that we have right now a way to address that problem. So again, I, I'm con my concern about electing a, a vice president tonight is really because I've actually heard from the absent counselor, uh, Councilor Dave Murphy, that he would like to weigh in on this matter. And he has an unfortunate annual meeting, I think he did express to the council president, um, that takes him out to the West Coast this, you know, third, Wednesday, third Thursday in November every year and regrettably could not attend tonight. But he did say that he was hoping to weigh in on the matter. And so I would just ask uh, the other counselors if they would, you know, just uh, honor that request, given that we do have a, have a process right now, should there be an emergency in the next two hours or in the next two weeks. And we do. Uh, Councilor Tase. <clears throat> I just want to um, echo or, or kind of chime in on, um, uh, Councillor Carney's uh, concern about uh, some of the most important input that we get here is when we ask our financial director different things. And, um, and it's not just during the finance segment of the meeting, it's throughout the entire meeting. Things are always coming up and if I don't know just exactly how we're going to be able to access that information to move the meeting forward somehow um, if, um, if we don't have access to the finance director during the meeting. It's, 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 it's a concern of mine. If I, if I may weigh in one more time, um, the, the, the beauty of this is that we were in the minority in the state by having the mayor preside over the council. And in fact, most cities in the state have figured out some of these things that we're struggling with right now. 
and in fact, actually were bounded almost by two of the newest cities in the state, in the Commonwealth, and that's Greenfield and, and, and East Hampton. And I don't think it would be uh, inappropriate to appeal to them and see how they conduct mm -hmm. their polity, to see how, I know that uh, Mike Tausnick uh, sits in East Hampton, sits in the yes, audience. Yes. But I mean, it, and so I understand people's concerns, but at the same time, I think that we have reason to feel comfort that we don't need to despair too much because fortunately um, other people have, have already dealt with some of these problems and have come up with reasonable solutions and then maybe we can look to them for the for how we how we do our business council labarge i attended um a city council meeting in east stanton two years ago and I was really impressed with that. And with the forms that we had on the Charter Committee, I highly recommended that we have a president and a vice president. And it's because I saw how they operate, and everything takes time. But they ran it very smoothly. I'm sure they've got nothing on us on time. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> I believe that we've taken our time as well. Councilor Freeman, change. Uh, so I'll just move on. Uh, we want to talk about the four person committee to review the ordinances. Uh, I'd like to suggest that that be councilors. Um, the clerk serves as the fifth, and uh, I think that the council normally deals with ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, th I don't know why it wouldn't be councilors. So I'd like to suggest that the, the council. Uh, that the council president pick the councilors for for this committee assignment for for the public's information and and the city solicitor can actually weigh in it's better the the reason that the establishment of this commission is to review actually we we dealt with the first 100 and some odd pages in the charter there were a lot of ordinances some some that are have gone past their prime and are are rotting on the vine that don't make sense there needs to be some cleanup and this is the part of the charter where um, we enlist some poor souls who have to hack through this stuff. Uh, the city solicitor has done a fair chunk of this along with the city clerk. They've gone through a bunch of this, but this, the reason, this is not a separate, we have an ordinance committee, but this is a, a commission that is um, ad hoc basically, or no, no, it's a standing committee, I'm sorry. I think it's a, is a standing committee for a regular review? No, it's ad hoc, right? So, okay, so th this, this is designed to, finish the cleanup essentially so this is this is the subject that we're talking about this committee let me be clear if I may please president um, uh, the clerk and I went through the special acts that were attached to the Charter we have not gone through the you haven't touched at all um, those were the multiple special acts that were filed over year after, you know time after time to um, you know to amend our charter and we're trying to figure out which ones we needed and to keep and which ones we we needed to be repealed um but i have not gone through the the ordinances we haven't paid on that yet <laughs> <laughs> the, the ticker has been running but thank you for the clarification uh, along those same lines of the four uh, person committee um i i'm inclined to think that it is almost within the charge of the ordinance committee, which I know has other potholes and other complaints and um, rules that uh, we're charged with dealing with. But it seems consistent with the duties of that committee to also uh, examine the ordinances as they are in the book for their, consistent, for their consistency with the newly adopted charter. So um, without the chair of ordinance uh, present, I still would consider that might be an avenue rather than, you know, taking folks, other folks. I do agree with Councilor Freeman Daniels that it should be councilors, um, but I would suggest that it may be something within the purview of the Ordinance Committee. Councilor Spector. Um, when I saw this, I, the only reason I thought the Ordinance Committee may not want to do it is because it's such an added job. I think it makes sense. But if, if uh, and the chair isn't here again, it may be something we want to postpone for two weeks. If the ordinance committee is willing to take it on, this is something you folks know how to, how to do and you've been doing it. I would agree with that. I just want to make sure it's not too much given everything else you're doing. So it was just out of a sense of courtesy mm -hmm. that when I saw that. So, Councilor Daniels and Councilor Labarge and Councilor Adams. Uh, I don't believe 
I'm going to ask the, the city solicitor, can this, I don't think this d duty can be conferred to the ordinance committee. First of all, you'd have to add the city clerk to the ordinance committee. Mm -hmm. And then you would have to add one more person because okay. the ordinance right. committee is three. And then we would need to add one plus the clerk. No, my suggestion was not to give it the task to the to ordinance committee, but to take those members of the ordinance committee, add one in the clerk, and make, you know, another. The, the, this is a large job. This is a significant it is. Uh, amount. For anyone. Um, for anyone, but I, I will put in a plug for the councils to say that you also already do a lot of work, and this, but this is a, a, a this is a lot of, this is a lot of lifting to go through all these orders. If I may continue and on my, my you know, point then. It, it, it's not only reviewing them, it's also revising them mm -hmm. and bringing the revisions back to the council. Are you suggesting then in contrast to Councillor Freeman Daniels' suggestion that it should be councillors, because I think, are you suggesting that it's too much work for already hardworking councillors? Um, yeah, I, I just want to point out that this is this is um, a year-long task. Right. Whether uh, whether be... it's councillors, citizens, some combination, yeah. that's for the council to decide. That's a political mm -hmm. question. It's not a legal question. Okay. Either one is. Per perfectly I think that's acceptable clear. Under the, yeah. Uh, Charter. Uh, it's obvious. Councilor, Councilor Adams and Councilor Tacey. No, he answered what I wanted. Okay, Councilor Adams. I was just going to say that we could have four councilors, but it might also make sense to have three councilors and someone from the drafting, the charter drafting committee. So, mm -hmm. just for consideration. Mm -hmm. Councilor Tacey and then Councilor Yeah, and, and um, back to my point before this clear and concise document. This is a huge load of work that I said before that's in front of us, and it's not. It's going to go on for a long time, and but there's, and I hate to use the term, but there's some low-hanging fruit, I think, now that I'm, I'm kicking all this around, and I'm actually trying to grasp the enormity of what we're going to have to do here. Um, I don't know if it, should, if it should be all counselors, but what I will say, there's some low-hanging fruit, and it would be such as the election of a vice president is something that we could probably get out of the way almost immediately. So I would, you know, and I, and I have talked to I have talked to uh, Council Labarge about this. I've kicked it around, but now I'm really starting. I'm starting to see that this is really going to be a tremendous project, and I can see it morphing. And uh, so some of the low hanging fruit, anything that we can get out of the way as soon as possible, I think is uh, would be advantageous to us. Councilor Freeman Daniels. So I'll just say again, um, just reading the uh, Vice yeah. reading the actual rule. It says immediately after the election. So. This is, we're actually past the immediately spot. Um, so we, we have to pick four persons. I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't do that tonight. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think probably there are probably four people on the council that are interested. If they're not, we have a problem. I'll say that I'm interested, so that's one. Now we only have to find three more. And it does, again, say immediately after the election. Since there's no immediately can mean different things to different people. I agree with Councilor Adams. I think it would be very helpful to have someone on a charter committee if we could find someone willing to, to do this. They went through this for a couple of years. I think intent is a key component. I think to have somebody there who is with the process the whole time, I think makes a lot of sense. Council Carney and then Council Labarge. I agree with the immediacy. However, I think immediate can be in two hours or in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I suggest maybe uh, deferring until two weeks and can still considering two weeks in an immediate definition, broadening the definition of immediate to include two weeks, because the chair of ordinance for whom mm -hmm. this is, some, is also not present and I think has expressed some interest in being a, allowed to weigh in on some of these really important grave matters. So I, in my sense, I, I think that this is something that um, would still fall within the parameters of immediate should it be dealt with in two weeks. Councilor Labarge? I'm going to echo what Councilor Carney is saying. Councilor Freeman-Daniels? Um, I'm going to immediately disagree, so I'll talk to you in two weeks. <laughs> Uh, any other thoughts on on what uh, now that we have the city solicitor here? This is he where he's on the clock. So Council I don't know if this is a city solicitor thing, but before we say what we're going to, I'd like to clarify what it is we're going to decide in two weeks. It seems to me we're going to decide. I think it's been put out there 
that we're going to decide on this four member committee mm -hmm. in two weeks that we are going to vote on the vice president in two weeks mm -hmm. is there anything else that we're going to do in two weeks <laughs> that's on here. do research <laughs> Uh, if I may, I would ask you to consider how you would do nomination or appointments for the uh, the commission review. Okay. Yes. I mean, the, the ordinance review, mm -hmm. so that, that there be a staff on that committee. If there are people who are interested in expressing interest, can make a good case to you so they can yep. be presented. Um, just trying to figure out how you're going to do that. Um, is, I mean, we, uh, Councilor Schwartz. So. Um, I appreciate you raising your last point because I was thinking about that too with this two week delay and exploring uh, who's going to, you know, if there is a member of the Charter Commission who would want to serve on this, what does that mean? What are we, mm -hmm. how do we process that? And I, I would think that we would um, nominate, as it were, I don't, I don't necessarily mean it pr technically procedurally, but somebody could volunteer as a counselor to be the recipient of, uh, of interest. You know that the point person, if if the person is interested in serving on that committee, and that gets out, I mean, through this meeting tonight and through the minutes and and maybe through the media, um, and and we have that you know a, a, this interval of time where people can express interest, and we bring that to, with us to the council. Mm -hmm. This this yep. is a council appointment. This is not an appointment by the mayor nor by the council yep. president. So this right. is it's a council. Yeah. Right. This council. But there's got to be some vehicle. No, you're for absolutely right. I, well, I, I want to be clear on that. So, uh, council respective and council. Well, as yes. as chair of the appointments committee, and we have an appointments committee. If the other councilors felt um, that it was appropriate. Um, I would say that maybe our committee should uh, be willing to be the point person and our committee could take applications and, and do this and we do this fairly quickly. Um, Immediately. If the rest of the I'll council feels that. that's I'll second appropriate that one too. Uh, Alan, if um, it is, is it your understanding that we should actually present this as a resolution to defer this vote? Would that, that, that you know, what I'm asking is, would it be appropriate for the council to take a vote to defer this immediate decision till uh, the next council meeting? Or is it just understood that this is the will of the council? That um, this is the part we're making up. So, so, so what you're saying is, you're the should we break the charter? You know, the, the, <laughs> well, <laughs> immediately. The transition been resolution, been and I would pass it as a resolution. And because the, there is a, uh, a section allowing you to pass transition resolutions or orders. And um, this may be your first one. That's, that's what I was, thank you. If I may, just because there's a lot of discussion about immediacy, if we were being truly consistent with the intent of the charter, we would have well in advance of the vote scheduled a meeting. You're right. 48 hours or however, what our, you know, our, our required time, mm -hmm. scheduled a council meeting to occur at 12.01 a.m. so that that would happen as immediate as possible so that's why I'm suggesting that, you know, we have some latitude around immediate. Certainly we have until the end of this meeting, and I think we may have the ability to do some of this, not in a rushed way, but maybe a little bit more measured. I agree with Councilor Spector that we have an appointments, and eval appointments committee that is well-versed in evaluating and looking at those who've expressed interest and interviewing. And I would support that as being, and Councilor Spector as chair of that committee, committee, as being the point person for those who wish to serve on that committee to express interest. Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Adams. I just, I, I don't know. I, I could, I could, I guess I could read this, the section of the charter that is now the law of the land. Of course, I didn't vote for it. Uh, immediately after the election at which the charter is adopted, the city council shall appoint four persons to a committee to begin to review the city ordinances for the purpose of preparing such revisions and amendments as may be needed or necessary to bring them into conformity with the provisions of this charter and to fully implement the provisions of this charter. That's the first sentence. Mm -hmm. Immediately after the election, it, it, we, the, the, the council president could have called an earlier meeting than this, but this is our first opportunity. If there is, as many of the councilors have said, a, a portion of time between this meeting and the next one, then it's not immediate. So it just, my it clearly reading this, 
I, I, I have to ask the city, I'm just gonna directly ask the city solicitor, in your opinion, is waiting two weeks to enact something that says immediate in, in line with the charter? Well, it, um, it does say immediate, and, and obviously there are different views of immediate. The charter also says that the mayor and council in office at the time the charter is adopted and the mayor and successor city council elected under the charter may adopt measures that clarify, concern, confirm, or extend any of the transitional provisions in order that the transition may be made in the most expeditious manner possible. Uh, I think that, that it's well within, um, I don't think we're, we're pushing the envelope here to um, to do this in an orderly process so that, I mean, we're not appointing people who don't know they're going to be appointed and all of a sudden, you know, are sitting at home watching on TV and find out they've just been appointed to the... Uh, <laughs> Dave Murphy. <ordinance> <laughs> Councilor Adams and Councilor Specter. I think rather than have any further discussion about the definition of immediacy, if, if, if councilors want to move something to the next meeting, I think they should move to move it. I'm gonna move it. That's what I was gonna do. I was gonna take make a motion. See what this council's definition of immediate is by vote. I'd like to make a motion that we move until the next meeting. I'll second that motion. The various things that I outlined before. Thank specifically, you. All of, specifically all four of the, all the, rec yes. all the recommendations we moved forward to the next meeting. Okay, so the resolution before us is to move the four bullet points uh, listed in uh, Attorney Seawald's memorandum to be decided and deliberated for the next council meeting, the first council meeting in December. Five, five bullet points. points. I'm sorry? Five bullet points. Five, five, five bullet points, I'm sorry. Five bullet points. That's right, is, is that right? Yep, call the question. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? <coughs> Passes. Thank you. I see this. As we hack our way through this, we'll, uh, and, and, and again, I'm going to beg the community's indulgence and the council's indulgence and, and, and ask that with some understanding that what we are trying to do is to abide by the spirit of the charge that's been put before us and that we want more transparent government, greater uh, distinct visibility of power, and that that the efforts, that it, the, the deliberation you're witnessing is a reflection of that. It is our intent to enact this ASAP, but also not to be so rushed as to do it badly. So exactly. I appreciate I appreciate anyone's indulgence. Councilor Speck. Just one, a point of information just on this last piece. I'd like to ask all the councilors if you know anybody who was on the Charter Review Committee personally, because those people came from the various wards. It'd be really helpful if you could contact them almost to me like tomorrow or the next day, ask them if they'd be willing to serve on this, have them get hold of me if they are. Um, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Can I ask clarification from the council? Who are you inviting to serve on this commission, this committee? Repeat that, please. Who are you inviting? To All right, I'll make a recommendation commission? that it, I would recommend that, that it, it, I would be open to anybody serving on the committee. I would encourage people who served on the Charter Review Committee, if they are willing, to put their names forward as well, and I would urge them to. I think that we should be open to, to anybody to serve on the committee would be. Councilor Adams, then Councilor Do you, do you mean some combination of, of councilors and committee members? Well, I, I thought the assumption would be, and maybe I'm wrong, the assumption was going to be three councilors and one other person on the committee. Um, if I, I would just say I, I do think that that's an assumption. I don't think that we came to that determination. Exactly. Of how many councilors you mean? Or, or if any councilors. Right. There's been no recommend. This could be solely members of the drafting committee solely members of the public okay. the only step stipulation is that it, it, it includes the con uh, city clerk so again i think that that's something that we will need to as a body deliberate um in two weeks okay so, so as of Fair now we're opening an invitation to the public to consider submitting their candidacy for serving on this committee of which we, we, so let me understand this, of which we do not know whether there'll be anywhere from one to four possible openings. Council Schwartz. And I, in terms of uh, a, a community no member understanding the nature of this commitment, I think it would be useful uh, that the, and I realize it's a work in progress, 
it's not yet formed, and the committee itself will need to define it. But presumably, I mean, the, I heard this is I consider to be a year-long process. I mean, so we're talking about a one-year commitment. We're talking about meetings once a week. Once a week? I bet you. Week. We did on the charter. Three times a week. You're, do, you're, to you're actually so. reviewing all the ordinances mm -hmm. in the city <laughs> of Northampton. You just said four times a week. No, 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 no. <laughs> four times? But, <laughs> well, <laughs> just, it's a prodigious <laughs> charge. You're reviewing <laughs> all the ordinances of the city of Northampton okay. and making recommendations for changes if changes are necessary, and uh, then we deliberate those changes that are proposed and vote on them. But this committee is charged with a significant job. It is. So anyone who's interested in signing up, recognize that you're signing on for a, 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 a lot of work. With no recompense. Yes. Let's be clear. No recompense. Councilor Freeman Dames. Uh, I'll just reiterate that uh, I don't think that uh, I think that it should be councilors that serve on this committee, um, no, not only because we receive compensation for it, number one. Number two, we deal with an ordinance all the time, so I don't think that it's uh, out of our purview. And number three, that I'm, I actually disagree. I don't think that uh, members of the Charter Redrafting Committee are, are necessary to, be, to sit on this committee. Um, I have to agree with that. I really feel just like with our Charter Committee, we had three counselors on it and it was extremely helpful having our attorney with us going through that charter and the language and so forth but I have to agree with counselor Owen Freeman Daniels in regards to ordinances that we are the ones who deal with the ordinances so I like the idea that Councillor Carney suggested, too, about the <coughs> Ordinance Committee. I mean, you have three councillors on that. Maybe one or two might want to be on that. But I think there should be four councillors to be on that committee and then the city clerk. That's my feelings. Councillor Schwartz. Did, did we not establish all... I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about Me our too. procedure right here. I thought we just had clarity that we were inviting invitations and then we could I decide know. we could decide right. to accept or reject but that we I thought I just want to make sure we're going linearly that we we made a decision to have we're going out to the public we made a decision to invite uh, or is that something we should vote on should we vote on it should we vote on whether or not we're inviting people uh, community members to apply and then then the council makes its decision is that a motion? Yeah, that uh, sounds fine. I, I don't know. Are you making a motion? Well, <laughs> circular. <laughs> I don't know. I? Sure, I'll make a motion. Um, I move that um, we invite applications to sit on the ordinance review committee, uh, applications from community members to sit on the ordinance review committee. I second that. Uh, discussion, Councilor okay. Carney. Um, yes, right. thank you. Um, this could go either way. I think once, as Councillor Schwartz just uh, presented, there is no harm in opening an application procedure that um, even if it's still undefined, there's no harm in asking if, those, if there are people who are interested to let us know they're interested. Even if after that uh, process, even if we see those that we find, we determine that we want this to be a body of four counselors and the city clerk. I do want to remind the uh, counselors that as is the practice with any of our subcommittees, our committees are always open to all counselors to come and be present. However, I think the chair of um, the chair of who of this committee should be notified so that should there be a majority of council members show up, we make sure it's notified as a full council meeting so as not to violate the open meeting law. But our past practice has always been that even though um, voting may be confined to those five members of a committee, uh, input and constructive input has always been welcome from any other counselors on, on, mem on, on the body. Just a point of yes. process, I think this is what Councilor Schwartz was also saying. I think we just voted that, and I think it was important to clarify the piece about who's going to be on the committee. 
But I think the other discussion, my sense was that we were saying is that we're postponing these decisions mm -hmm. and even things you're bringing up until two okay. weeks from now. Is that correct? And okay. that we were going to, yes. so we could have time to think about yeah, it, okay. established committee, and we'd move on now. That, that was my sense of that vote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think appointments and evaluations is, is well versed in, in evaluating any applicants. I don't think that you're going to end up with a thousand applications. <laughs> I think we may be scrambling <laughs> trying to fill this uh, these these seats or or these uh, positions. So um, it doesn't at all scare me to invite somebody from the public or whoever that would be interested in giving us some assistance in this and um, it wouldn't and wouldn't bother me a bit but I would uh, think that it would also be in your purview as appointments and evaluations to say look at maybe we need four counselors or maybe we don't need four counselors um, but you won't know until you put it out there and see who applies who knows you may get some stellar but I would hope that four counselors would also apply. Counselor Sleewall might apply. Uh, <laughs> Look at his eyes. He may very well become a part of this board. But, but I, I, I think he's supposed to be when, on it. When, no, when uh, Counselor Sewall was serving Advisor. with you on that committee, he was a citizen. He was not yes. the city solicitor yes. being paid and on the clock. Counselor Thank you. But, uh, by, the charter, is he, uh, by the charter, is he not also asked to be present, at least in an advisory capacity, yes. to this board? Yes. I'm an advisor to that committee. Yeah. Councilor Freeman here. Daniels. Uh, can, can I ask, a, can I make a friendly amendment to that uh, motion that um, anyone who wants to sit on this committee needs to apply? Yeah. I think that's including counselors. So, uh, you know, that sure. if a, uh, the, the counselor has to go through the same process <laughs> that anyone else would. And the process of application would be just send a letter or email uh, expressing your interest well that that that's not a part of my friendly amendment I, I my only uh, the only reason I ask when you at when you say that you apply that we have actually what that means mm -hmm. <laughs> but, <laughs> so again, we, I just I'm making a friendly amendment that anyone that's that's mine is there a second to the I'll second that okay. I'll just ask for clarification purposes then the same question yes. the president asked if we are if we can assume if we pass this uh, as it's been friendly amended, mm -hmm. um, that folks could express that interest by means of an email to Councilor Spector or a verbal um, request. And would that apply then to any members of the public or drafting committee or anyone interested? They should communicate directly to Councilor Spector. It, it is. Could that be, um, I know I think I just heard Councilor Freeman Daniel say that's not to be assumed. And if it's not, could it be further clarified or further amended if it's needed friendly to just expressly say how that folks would communicate with the, with the council? Would you like to make that as a motion? So, well, uh, Councilor Schwartz, you've had two friendly amendments now proposed to your, your <laughs> uh, original motion. I, I didn't want to make a friendly amendment. I was just hoping that, that even the original maker sure. would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is this, are we going to call this a board or a committee? What's the charter say? Yeah, and we have, a, we, we do have an committee. application uh, already that the city has. A committee. This, this is a committee. Yeah, it's a, it is a committee. It's, it's a, a committee. 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 Councillors shouldn't be making out and that. As such, to make no, 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 I get that, but maybe members of the public. Those, to, to, those get, are, to get that. Those are for mayoral appointments. Yeah. That form is for mayoral. Period. Appointments. That's all they're for. We yeah. can't use them for anything. Okay. If I, if, if I may, I think that, that, that given the intent and what everyone's trying to do here that's appropriate, if somebody sends their intent or aspiration of serving on this committee, that that should serve as an application. Yes. Okay. Uh, but I, but I, think, I do think it should be something written or, or an email or something, not just right. a verbal. Also, we'll make sure there's a process in place that we yeah. can. Just, just have something. a document yes. yeah, of some type. So the motion stands as uh, uh, Councilor Schwartz's motion is what we're voting on as amended. Is anyone ready for a vote for it? I'd like all to move it. Okay, all the, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Thank you, God bless Mary. Uh, we're voting on the amendment first. Uh, both amendments? Two, 
Can we do take both amendments? Well, you have, right, on the front of the amendments, you can take them both. All those in favor of the amendments? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Now to the original motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? Nay. Abstentions? All right, the resolution passes. Uh, we have any other need for Councilor Seawall? Do, I should remind everyone that we are 15 minutes past a public hearing on setting the tax rate. So, um, thank you, Councilor C. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thanks for the memorandum. And you and I are going to be talking a lot of no days to come. So, now. We are up to the tax classification, the annual public hearing on property tax classification for FY 2013 for the city of Northampton. Um, this is, we're opening the public hearing. Move, uh, can I have Moved to open hearing. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, objections? Abstentions? Uh, and now it would be appropriate to recognize the assessor. Don't Sarah. Move to second. Second it. <laughs> All those in favor of recognizing Joan Seraphin. Aye. 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 All those opposed? And abstentions. Joan, thank you for coming. Good evening. I recognize her. You, yes. <laughs> We've seen you around town. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> Staring at our houses for some reason. That's right. <laughs> Um, tonight we're having the classification meeting to vote on the tax rate. Um, if you vote for a factor of one, that would be an even rate for all classes of property. And the expected rate is to be $14.23. Um, that may change a few pennies one way or the other by the time we do the rounding, but it will be real close. Um, as most of you know, we could shift some of the burden onto the commercial properties. Um, but as you know by my booklet here, if you were to shift <coughs> what we're allowed to shift, um, the tax rate for the residentials will go down to $12.56, but the commercials would go up to $20.82. And so um, even though it sounds really good for the residentials, it puts a big burden on the commercials because their values are so high. So that is one of the um, things that you need to vote on. Um, then also there's a residential exemption. And that sounds really good. Uh, you have to. Um, domicile in the property so somehow we would have to do a survey or something to find out um, the people that don't domicile in their property and they would not be allowed to get an exemption um, the average house now is 297 323 and um, everybody in the residential class that domiciled in the house would get a $59,000 deduction from their value but the the rate would go up to compensate for that um, it was kind of hard for me to judge how many exemptions would be given but um, the rate would go up to sixteen dollars and eleven cents so that means the higher priced houses would have to pick up the difference plus um, the apartments get the higher rate. That's the glitch in that. And most communities, the Department of Revenue told me there's very few communities that have passed this law. And um, it's usually people with seashore property, like down at the Cape. Mm -hmm. The community really likes that because it puts the burden on the people that don't live there year round. The third. Um, option is taxing <coughs> a small group of businesses <coughs> give them a lower rate on subtract an exemption <coughs> excuse me um, 
and they, they would get a lower rate. But the problem is that the owner of the property would get the break on his tax bill, and I'm not sure that he would make up a little check, like it for Thorns, for instance. Um, I'm not sure that he would make out a little check to everybody in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really, um, I don't know who decided to do this, but um, it would be an exemption for businesses that have uh, less than a million dollar income and 10 employees. And say it's a shopping mall, uh, maybe, um, and there's six businesses in there if two qualified but they don't all qualify then nobody gets it so that would be the third thing and <laughs> I thought it was interesting we were able to pick up um, 44 four, uh, 488 035 um, for new growth which came really hard this year because many of our Commercial projects were just started or partially complete, like the medical building. Um, but next year, it lo really looks much, um, much better for the city as all these new projects that are going on, the two banks, the shopping mall, another medical building, and we'll be taxing the first medical building at 100%. Mm -hmm. So um, that looks really good for the commercial base. Um, I did want to point out, I don't know if you noticed in the next to last page, um, we, we did, um, gain a little bit in the commercial up from 19.8 up to 20.21. And this is, um, this is really kind of good because we used to have 25% commercial and 70 percent, 75% residential, but because of all the new residential construction, um, the commercial permits could just not keep up. So it's kind of healthy that we have been able to pick that up a little bit, and I see that getting much better in the future. Yes? Can you explain the trend in the tax rate from 2002 and how we went up in 2003, then down for several years, and then back up again? Well, it's, it's what we do with our values. Every three years, we have to get certified. But every year now, we have to be um, within 5% of 100%. So for the last two years, we haven't. Um, I'm not sure which, which years we did trend. I'd have to go back and look. I know in... Um, in 10, we had a reval, and of course, as your values adjust, the tax rate adjusts. And then in 07, we had a reval, and so it depends on if your values are going up or going down, and the tax rate just keeps adjusting. Because of two and a half, you kind of start out kind of backwards. You look at the amount of money that you can raise, and you can't raise any more than that, and then you and then you. Um, you have your budget and your estimated receipts. So you'll see the tax rate fluctuate. Um, as you, uh, uh, sometime I should provide you with a uh, list going back even further. I, would, I look at the list and sometimes we had a tax rate of $78. Can you imagine that? That was before two and a half. So this really limits us. We take our levy limit, which the state gives us, and we add our um, two and a half, which is about a million dollars. And then we add our new growth. And of course, the new growth fluctuates depending upon your building permits. And they really haven't been as plentiful lately because of the economy. And then um, into that levy limit, you add um, your overrides. And this was the first time for the uh, police station. So that made a 26 cent increase for the police station for this year. Mm -hmm. It was about close to 800,000 that we're raising for that. And then we have our other overrides that we're paying off, the schools, fire station. Uh, Council LaBarge. Yes. Joan, as long as I've been a city councilor, I've always seen us doing a uniform tax rate. 
I've never seen it change. My concern is if a decision is being made to change it another way, how detrimental will this be to the businesses here in the city of Northampton? How and what effect will it have? Well, I don't think in this economy that you really want to raise the commercial rate. I think we want to encourage more businesses to come in because that will help the residential people. The more that the commercial pays, the less on the, the residential people. And I'm hoping as we go along, and it looks like our mayor is working hard to get some people in, and we all want King Street to be active. We have two new car dealerships coming, two new banks. So it, it, looks, it looks like, the, even as bad as the economy is, it looks like the commercial is picking up. Also, now when we're talking about exemptions and so forth, um, say somebody owns a home, has a mortgage on it, has the taxes to pay, there is a way that they can go ahead and get an exemption from their taxes. Can you explain that? Because I've gotten calls about this and I've called you on it. Yeah, we have uh, we have exemptions for um, elderly people, um, and um, when Mayor Higgins was here, she increased the income by five thousand, which um, added to the number of people that qualified by far. There is an um, uh, income limit and also an estate limit. They don't have to count the value of their home, but if they have other property or money in the bank or stocks and bonds, we need to count that. But we have quite a few. We probably have two, 200 that qualify for that, and it's $650 for that elderly exemption. Um, I have been down the senior center to promote it, and it, I went to the civic center one time. I'd be glad to go again in case. Then we also, if they don't qualify for that one because, the in, because of their income, we have another one, it's called 17C. That's it. And it's for uh, widows or widowers and people over 70. So there is no income limit on that one, but um, you can't have more than 40,000 in your personal estate. And that one is um, $175 for that exemption. We have vet veterans exemption at various amounts. Some of them are $1,000 if they are 100% or have great disabilities. Um, we also have blind exemptions if they have a um, notice from the Commission of the Blind. And um, I guess that's about, about it for the exemptions. Isn't there another exemption though? If you're 65 and over and say that there is an exemption where you can defer your taxes yes, that's it. with the city. If you remember at one time you um, changed it from 8% um, interest down to 5% interest, which was really good because a bank loan isn't that much. And so we have about 12 people that get what's called a 41A, and um, they have to be 65. The other, the other two are it's 70. Some people are able to get that 650 on the 41C and then also defer the remaining or part, part of it. They don't have to do the full amount if they don't want to. It's up to them each year and they have to file each year. And then um, when the property is sold or transferred, that money has to be paid back to the city. So that's, yeah. that's section 41A? That's for, uh, called a chapter 41A. It's deferred the taxes with the city. Okay, because um, I've gotten calls on that and I've talked with you about we that. We probably have about 12 people that have done that, and we put a lien on the property just to protect ourselves that we get our money first. Councilor County. Thank you. Thank um, you, Joan. Joan, on, on page six, you have a really interesting um, uh, schedule. And it seems to reflect that there's the relationship between the value of the home and the difference in the actual tax amount is um, inversely proportional, I guess. Right. So the lower the value of home, 
you actually uh, have a significant tax decrease in right. the higher valued homes. So the example being a $200,000 <coughs> home will see a tax decrease of $581, and a $700,000 home will see a tax increase of right. $158,000. And so um, I guess that's I'm not really sure I understand the arithmetic of, uh, about how that Well, it's working. hard to know. I, I really don't think we uh, we have a lot of... This is about the residential exemption? Is that yeah. Right? This is, right. It's hard to okay. determine because I'm, I think most of our one families, and we probably have to do some kind of a survey, um, I think most of the people live there. It isn't like in some communities where you have a lot of rentals. And then in the two and three families and the condos, we definitely have to get in touch with the people to find out you wouldn't want them to get this exemption and they're getting rent. They wouldn't be able to get it. Right. Well, as I said, um, unfortunately, it's the apartments that get the burden if we do this. Um, and one of the large complexes, <laughs> I figured it would add 20000 to their taxes if we did this. So I just wanted to point that out. Good question. Um, the Board of Assessors voted on these rec for, the, for the set of recommendations. Um, were there any dissenting votes, or was it unanimous? It was una unanimous. Councilor So you were talking about a tremendous amount of apartments and so forth, and there would be a significant amount of an increase to the to be. the landlord, right? Yeah. So which means it's not good because the people who are renting are the ones who apparently will get hit with an increase of rental. Right. That's and there's the such a problem. That's the problem here. with this exemption. Exactly. I imagine a lot I don't know, but I imagine at the Cape where they have these exemptions, they don't have a lot of apartments, but I don't really know that. But we do have quite a few apartments that take care of the lower income mm -hmm. people and this this would be a burden on them which they probably would turn over to the renters rather than pay themselves. That's true. Yeah. Questions for the uh, consultation? Yeah. I'm really not interested in putting any more burden on the commercial uh, sector at all and I've always um, believed in this factor one here in Northampton. It, we don't have uh, the uh, commercial base that places like Chicopee have and things such as that. Um, and and we are trying to encourage them. We just hired a new economic development director. Um, so I think I, I think it would send the wrong message to stop the factor of one at this point. I, I, and I, I intend to, to support the factor of one as I have in the past. And uh, right now, at this point, I don't think it's a time to change it. I don't think so, but. Any other questions? So just this, speaking about the residential exemption, uh, it's, it's you, you state that it's just, this is a, what I understand is an explanation. Because uh, it's a fixed dollar amount that gets reduced from each residential property if we were to enact the maximum residential exemption, um, that's thus the uh, lower valued homes would get a reduction but the, the burden would be transferred, so it would end up being assessed onto the higher value. Um, what you're saying is that the is that apartment buildings get caught in this net. They do. Right. So this would be a this to enact a residential exemption would would hurt the larger apartment buildings or even four to six unit apartment buildings, and it that would. and that will very much affect I think affordability. None of them would get any exemption at all. And then they would have to pick up the higher rate. Mm -hmm. I've estimated it to be sixteen dollars and eleven cents. Right. So, so instead of the fourteen twenty-three, yeah. it goes up around two dollars. So this on every thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm set. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the communities that uh, right away they wanted to burden the commercials. Mostly, it's the people that have much more than 20 percent of commercial value in their in their community so they went the 150 where they they increased it 150 percent their commercial 
And then, of course, after a while, you don't, you can't do it anymore. You're at the top. So then they passed a law where you could um, shift up to 170. So now mayors are trying, trying very hard to shift it back so to encourage uh, commercials to come in. For instance, um, Springfield has a tax rate of th for their commercials thirty nine dollars and ninety nine cents. <laughs> and and it takes it takes an act. It's of, awful uh, hard to shift the body to uh, to change it to defer more of the tax burden on the, on the okay. homeowner. So I'd like to make the motion that we, uh, I think it's, I think it's, there's a, a language that we keep a factor of one and assess the tax levy of uh, 1.4, what was it, 1.4? 1423. 1.43%. Second. Motion. Second. Motion and seconded. Discussion? No discussion. All right. All those in favor of setting the tax rate. Is it, can I can yeah. I say this is a this a hearing? So should we? Uh, the, yeah, you need to close the hearing. Thank you very much. Should we allow the, <laughs> Thank you all. If this is a hearing, should we? We, we allow the vote on this. We vote on the finance. I'm sorry. So that motion, the, okay. that motion Again, occurs. If the if we uh, if we have a hearing, should should the public have an opportunity to speak? Yeah, the public does have a yes. Thank you very much, Councilor Freeman Daniels. And let me clarify that the. Uh, the recommendation will come out of this but we will vote about on this in finance um, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this or recognize the mayor I would actually like to weigh in on it if I could um, please as a in my for my new position uh, in the spectator gallery um, nice I do I, I do want to express my support um, uh, for the factor of one I do think it's important that we keep it. I think it is an advantage that we have over other communities, including here in the Valley. Um, uh, we just had a couple of uh, companies that have made decisions about whether or not they will stay in Northampton, um, including Cole Morgan. Today I was at a groundbreaking for a company uh, that was looking to expand. They did look at some other locations in the Valley, and some of those other communities do have a higher commercial rate. So I do believe it provides us with an advantage. The other uh, thing that I would emphasize about uh, about it is that we, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, small locally owned businesses, which I think distinguishes us from some of these other communities that have maybe larger corporations uh, where uh, where they may have that capacity, national capacity, uh, to be able to afford those kinds of tax rates. We're trying to keep more dollars locally, support local businesses, small businesses, uh, family-owned businesses in many cases. So I, I am uh, a strong proponent that we keep the single-rate tax rate. So that's I want to just make that uh, plain from the administration's point of view. Thank you. Any, any questions for uh, the mayor on that point? I'm just a public He's the piece from the member of the public. Just a public. We, we can also ask the public <laughs> questions as well. So duly acknowledged. Any other members of the public wish to speak to this? Jasper? And please identify yourself again when you step up. So uh, my name is Jasper Lapiensky. I live in Ward 3. I, uh, I chose to come to this public hearing uh, primarily because Bill Dwight asked me to, and I appreciate that. I don't have a strong opinion. I do feel that um, from a logical standpoint, People who live in Northampton who own a property and live here, they live here. Businesses um, attract people from all around the valley to come in. So I would think that from a purely logical perspective that the uh, commercial rate should be higher. However, I recognize that economically that is not necessarily the uh, most effective thing to do. On the other hand, the uh, economy in Northampton is stronger than in other places, and the one person whose counsel I asked on this is a local business owner I know who is an extremely conservative Republican businessman. And uh, after lecturing me for about five minutes on why we should never raise taxes ever under any circumstances, he finally said, but if you're going to have a difference, it should be higher on businesses. And I said, why? And he said, because people's homes are their castles and they will react more strongly to an increase on their homes than an increase on businesses. Um, 
the only other thing I can think of to say is that I did try to ask a left-wing business owner that I know, but she was not there. <laughs> so uh, that's that, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Bill, for inviting me to, to speak okay. at this. Thank you for actually participating. I appreciate that. Hmm. Actually, actually, I would I would like to add that uh, since there aren't really business owners here to speak at it, it seems that they perhaps don't have a terribly strong opinion either. Um, if I made to that point, in the past in these hearings, the Chamber of Commerce at least has represented um, testimony on this point as we review this every year, emphatically stating um, and, and affirming what the mayor just said and what the assessor is recommending as well. I mean, probably for obvious reasons, but that's been the case, and that's not the case today. Mm. Are they here today? No. Okay. I, and I don't think so. I don't see them anyway. Thank you, Jasper. Anyone else? I'd accept a motion for closing. Move to close the public hearing. Second it. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? The hearing is closed. Thank you. Do, do we need to remake the motion? I no, we make the motion. Okay. We are now going to adjourn. <laughs> Not a journal recess for the finance committee. Quick question for the yes. chair, actually into the uh, council clerk. Is there an internet problem right now connecting to Northampton Public Wi-Fi? Yeah. Okay. Where I'm not getting anything myself, unless you folks are both connected to Sandbox. Um, I have not been on Sandbox for very long, so it's. Uh, um, it was working. Yeah, Mine's working just fine. My entire yeah. packet. Oh, Eugene. <laughs> What's that, Eugene? My packet is in my. Um, Would you like a copy of the packet? Well, no. I'd like to know if I can go press a reset button or unplug and reboot the. Uh, it's not too far away. Take a recess. Five minute recess. Can we? So the make a motion. We take a five minute recess. Second it. <laughs> Jesse will second it for me. Second. Okay. Second. But hang on a second. second. The council's running amok here. All right. Well, um, actually, we need to. Um, so, Mary, there's no modem I can unplug or plug in? Okay. Thank you. What's the problem? The, the, the internet's not working. I have to go to 4G. Um, that's why my thing is not working. Well, if I, if I may, the. So. This, <laughs> I have to mention this leaf file now. Is that the? Okay. Before we, yeah, we're going to recess into finance. So before before finance, should that there's a late file being introduced from uh, the Energy and Sustainability Commission. Yes. Uh, the new appointment of uh, Lucia Miller. Um, Move to refer. It, it's no, sorry. No, it's no. from the we appointment committee this, to this refer to to recommend. Right. Right. She's and we're going to need to go ahead and suspend she's Rule 38 on this because we'll it's late saying, by I'll accept the uh, motion to suspend moved. Rule 38. Mo so moved. Second. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Moved to recommend. Second. Um, okay. Councilor Spector? Yes. We've moved to recommend. We moved to Move to recommend. We've uh, already it's, our, the, it's the motions and made and seconded. I'm trying to find the name. It's we Lucia suspended Miller. the rule. Lucia Lucia Miller. Thank you very Lucia much. Lucia Miller. Union Street. Uh, the term from October two, uh, 2012 to October 2015 as an associate member for the Energy and Sustainability Commission. And this was referred to our committee, I believe it was two meetings ago. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so we. Um, I believe Councillor Schwartz was actually at a Energy Commission meeting where she did a presentation. Um, I also interviewed her on the phone. So we did, did not interview her. This is one of those cases where the committee did not meet to interview her, but we felt we would move this forward. This is an applicant who actually the committee is using, I believe it's her, is it her PhD thesis yes. as a basis to do some evaluation in the city. This is a great candidate uh, for the committee. Um, and it's so one of those cases, and you know, we're open. I'm open to hearing from from counselors. If you are at all uncomfortable at times when we do this, we are, you know, we will hold a a uh, committee meeting to interview somebody specifically for this. But there are times where it just feels that the candidate is so stellar, or we can do a phone interview where it is, and then we can move forward with the recommendation. And that's one of those cases. But again. 
it, it, it is a shady, a gray area where if you have a referral and we don't actually, ha and I brought this up last time, and we actually don't have a committee meeting, we look to the council to give us clarification on that. Until they do, this process works very well for the applicant as well, because these are volunteers coming forward. And if we don't have to bring them into a committee meeting and we know that they're great candidates, then we ask that maybe there could be some leeway here. But okay. we highly recommend this candidate. Uh, let, me, let me add to that by saying that, in effect, I would say she had an interview times 10 by virtue of um, her attendance at our Energy uh, Sustainability Commission meeting where she did her presentation on uh, the efficacy of the energy concierge program and what worked and what didn't. And I, it, was, it was fantastic. It was in-depth. It was... 100% voluntary that she provided this to the commission. Um, I mean, it was in furtherance of her studies, but that she, you know, wanted to deliver the findings and um, and inform us. And so, her it, it was an, again, it was an interview times ten. It, she's we're incredibly State. fortunate to have her. Council Nope. No. She said it all. <laughs> Any other questions? I just have a question on the app. What what is NCMC? Northampton Community Music, Music Center. Center. Community Music Center. Okay. Thank you. I pulled that acronym out pretty quickly. That's good. <laughs> Did good. <laughs> it's crossing Any other questions? It's in your neighborhood. Yeah. Any other discussion on uh, the candidate? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Now we will recess to go into the Finance Committee meeting. Moving right along. <laughs> Was there a request for a recess? Yes, that's the part was. I missed. Would you would you would the council like to entertain a five minute recess? Yes. Is that their pleasure? Yes. Yes. We'll uh, we'll recess for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. That way we get to reboot.
Welcome back. This is the Northampton City Council. We're now proceeding into recess for the Finance Committee. Uh, Secretary will call the roll. Uh, here. Present. Here. I should note that, uh, and Councilor Dwight. Uh, well, the, ma <laughs> the mayor is on the call for the roll call. The mayor is no, as of the new charter, no longer serves on the finance committee. The mayor there is present along with uh, <laughs> Susan Wright, uh, the finance director, here to and and to present here because they're representing a few financial orders. Uh, but as it stands now, just a, as a, clar a clarification. Is this not one of those five bullet points that we're hoping to discuss? Um? This was not one of the five bullet points, I think. If this is, this is. It is. Is it? Is. Is it? Yeah. Oh, um, yes. Can I make a suggestion? Sure, sure. Well, the, the, the ordinance that creates a finance committee is not null as of now. Right. And, and the mayor is still the chair of that committee. Um, and, and, and so this is the awkward situation we have to figure out, but that we're going to, and we're going to take it up again next time. But for now, I would suggest, and anyone can feel free to disagree, I think the mayor probably should chair this committee because the, the charter doesn't nullify that ordinance mm -hmm. nor specifically preclude it. Uh, I concur. Uh, I think that the mayor can um, choose to uh, reject that because the mayor again we can't compel the mayor to serve on any committee that's a council committee if, if i may the city solicitor's uh recommendation also in this memo was essentially that the charter trumps everything just so we're clear so that the mayor does in point in fact have the right to <laughs> abstain as it were from from the committee but uh your honor do you, this will will move out of protocol and ask what's your pleasure here it was my intention uh to uh to withdraw myself voluntarily from the finance committee and not uh, not participate in the finance committee voluntarily, um, just as it would be my right under the old charter to not come to the city council meeting if I didn't want to. Um, I take a more strict interpretation of the charter, uh, which says that um, I the executive should and there's a division of powers clause that says that the executive should not perform any let should not exercise any legislative powers nor should the legislature exercise any executive powers. And I believe chairing a council committee, voting on a council committee, um, would be a violation of that. So that's my reason at this point. Um, I know that the ordinance does create the capacity for that. I still think that's a, 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 an open question. So. Um, and that does conform again. But I'm here because I want, because I'm putting forth financial orders to the finance committee, so I want to be here to discuss them or answer questions about them. Uh, Councilor Tacey had his hand up first. And <clears throat> but in the memorandum from uh, Attorney Seawald, one of the bullet points is the discussion, the process for the revision of the Code of Ordinance to, to remove the mayor from membership on the Economic Development Housing and Land Use and the Finance Committee. So has that not happened yet? No, well, we're going to discuss it. We're, we're going to discuss We're discussing it. that now, and the mayor has just actually voluntarily removed himself. Actually, by my way of seeing it, it's a done deal, basically. Yeah, that, that, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't read it that way in, in this. Well, he does have, he has the privilege has of removing privilege. himself voluntarily. Okay. So uh, as opposed to us removing him uh, as, a, as a council, he has removed himself. You still need to amend the ordinance. I'm just saying. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. No. No. It, it still it's needs to be amended not, so that it's a it, so he doesn't have to voluntarily remove himself at every finance committee meeting okay. here on in. But uh, in this instance, he's done so. Well, I, I get it. I do think it was a bullet point. Councilor Kern. Yeah, and I think it's clear yeah. that we decided we're going to discuss that more in in depth um, in two weeks. I would just recommend that for tonight, for this evening, maybe as we do with other department heads. We recognize the mayor because there's a list of financial orders to which we're going to ask, have questions. 
um, and ask if he would prefer not to join us at the table, then stand at the podium, and those questions can then, through the chair, be addressed to the mayor. I agree, I agree with that. I'll second that. I can also make a rule that says the mayor is always recognized at all our council meetings and just ask him to come to the podium whenever. Um, that's, I, I think that's something worth uh, considering presenting actually as a package. So, um, can, I, can I just make one more point? Sure. I, this is just off. This is not, this is apropos, but it, I think it's been settled already. Uh, my reading of the charter, again, does not preclude the council from asking the mayor to sit on a committee and even have voting powers. Uh, that my understanding is that the council can. Uh, Delegate it's a legislative body to to it to any any anybody we could in theory delegate it directly to the mayor or to some somebody who's uh, you know sitting on the street corner so you know if we if we chose to delegate that that's well within the bounds of the charter so we can't compel them to, serve to accept I would like to uh, acknowledge that we already said we we would have this discussion because I have some things back, but we're going to have this discussion in two weeks' time. Right. It's so at the next council meeting, right? The next council so that's, council meeting. that's that's like about three weeks. Uh, so with our financial. That we need to move. Finally. So, yeah. so on the finance committee, I'm going to move some things out of order because we have someone here from Smith Vocational who's actually had to endure a long evening already. We know we don't need to subject her any longer. So we're moving the financial order of the authorization to enter into educational and operational software contracts for student information systems for five years, which is your second item. We're moving up to the first, if everyone's okay with that. <coughs> um, Sorry, that's fine. Um, this is upon the recommendation of Mayor Narkowitz, who is present, uh, whereas Chapter 30B of the Massachusetts General Law requires City Council approval for all contract terms exceeding three years. And whereas school educational and operational software should be locked in for five years for price assurance, and whereas a five year contract offers stability for student records, data, and state reporting compatibility, and whereas a five year contract will reduce the cost over time of data conversion and training. Now, therefore, be it ordered, all school districts of the city of Northampton are authorized to enter into educational and operational software contracts for student informational systems for a period not to exceed five years. The mayor and Susan Wright are both present for your questions on the finance. Uh, mayor? Uh, yeah, essentially the um, uh, this is uh, an order that will allow the Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School uh, to purchase a new um, student database system. Uh, they're in the pro they've gone undergone a process to select a system that fits with uh, their vocational educational model, and so you actually have a, a recommended amendment to this that I think you can be dealt with on the council floor. But we are actually asking <coughs> five year be extended um, to five and a half years because the, um, we they they actually would like an additional half year for an installation process as well. Um, that was a sort of a late uh, breaking piece of information. So I know the clerk has that information, but um, it's essentially authorizing them to enter into this five and a half year or five year as it's written uh, contract uh, to be able to make this uh, uh, purchase of a new software system. And this is uh, software that uh, all the student information and grades and all the other information is managed by the school and NPS has a, has a comparable system as well. And there is um, someone here, uh, Susan Shepard from Smith Vocational Agricultural High School, if there are any specific <coughs> questions about the software or anything like that. Any questions from finance or from the, any of the other counselors? It's just an extension of, of six months, is that? Uh, uh, well, the original order is allowing them to enter into a five-year contract. They've actually since requested if that could be changed to five and a half months. Um, so that would be an, an amendment that could be offered in the full council, yeah, if, if you were amenable to it. And again, the extra six months was to allow time for the actual installation process um, before that five-year clock starts ticking. So, okay. Any other questions? I'd like to uh, offer the amendment. Okay. Uh, you're recommending? Yeah, recommend the amendment. 
for to make it five Second. and a half years. Second. Oh, you're in finance. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Uh, for a recommendation? For the amendment. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Mary points out that the amendment has to occur on the floor so the rest of the council can vote on it. So we'll, can you okay. make a recommendation as we just presented it? Yeah. So or would you amend your recommendation to the? To just the move, yes, to though. recommend it to move the full council floor. Okay. All those in finance? Aye. Aye. Okay. Now we move on to the second item, which is setting the tax rate, which we almost prematurely voted on as well. I'll, I'll entertain. Uh, uh, a motion to accept and set the tax rate for FY 2013. So moved. Second it. Second. And this is in finance, so I'm sorry. So the motion will have to come from finance. Yes. I move, see. First move to set the tax rate as, as proposed. And a second. Second. Okay. This is great because I can't vote or make motions, so it's a good thing at least two of you guys showed up or we would have been really up the creek. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, all those in favor of setting the tax rate? Aye. 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 And the financial, the third financial order is the appropriation or reserve from FY 2013 for the community preservation funds. Upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Community Preservation Committee, ordered that the following amounts be appropriated or reserved from fiscal year 2013 Community Preservation Fund estimated revenues $1,200,000 for fiscal year 2013 Community Preservation Purposes. $132,000 from FY13 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Open Space Reserve. Uh, $132,000 from FY13 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Historic Preservation Reserve. And $132,000 from FY13 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Affordable Housing Reserve. $60,000 from the FY total estimated CPA, you get it, administrative account. $744,000 from the same account to uh, budgeted reserve. Also, the following amounts be appropriated from the Community Preservation Fund budgeted reserve account for fiscal year 2013 Community Preservation Bonding Repayment Purposes. So, $125,000 for principal and $2,500 for interest for Forbes Library Bond, $80,000 for principal and $29,192 for interest for the Bean Farm Bond. $501.42 for interest for bean, uh, the Bean Farm ban, uh, five, FY 2012. $6,000 for interest for Florence Fields ban. Uh, oh, thank you. Second page was scary, but the- Yep, I'd like to recognize Wayne Fiden, please. Yes. Uh, oh, there's a motion to recognize Wayne Fiden. Ed, do you want to make a presentation first, Mayor, though, on this? Oh, we have, oh I, I'm sorry. We need a motion first before we start to move, to approve. move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor. You want to step up first, and then we'll actually. No, I was. I was. Uh, we have a staff person here who can All right. speak about it. All uh, right. Uh, you move to Sarah Lavalley. Sarah Lavalley. Sarah Lavalley. Uh, all those in favor of recognizing Sarah Lavalley. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, so, um, so this is the standard yearly allocation of the CPA monies that will be coming in into the accounts that will allow for debt repayment um, allocation to projects and reserving for future years. So this has been done every year since the CPA has been in existence. It's, it's actually mandated by the, the law, that, the establishing law. That it is. So this is the 10% set asides and then the remainders into the budget and reserve. Yeah, and just explain it's one hundred and thirty two thousand dollars three times. Just explain that uh, how, how the numbers worked out. So that's the required 10 percent of our annual revenues right. that are that must be set aside into the open space accounts, the um, the historic account and the um, and the affordable housing reserve. I, I just know that when you had said one hundred thirty thousand th three times, somebody would have a question as to why it's one hundred and thirty two thousand. But it is just 10 percent of each of the items for for the year. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions for Sarah Lavalley? No. On the council? Mm -hmm. No? At some point, is there a is there a sheet, is there a spreadsheet that tells us just exactly where we are 
every one of these items out for 10 years or however this goes this goes out uh, that we, would be helpful I think if the council could see a spreadsheet on just exactly where the where the money is being spent and and how far it goes out sure um, each we, individual item we can tell you how much it's being spent but we don't know exactly what our estimated revenue will be each year right but but you know what we have to pay and stuff that we've already put out yes as far as debt repayments yeah yes and, and I think that would be helpful if the entire council could see that because I know this is this is enough for tonight but um, just so we know where we're going sure um, and just a quick snapshot of that um, fiscal year 2013 will be the last fiscal year for the Forbes library bond yep. um, there's 14 more years on the bean farm bond um, the bean Allard bond and then Florence Fields has 15 years left to go that that one's yet to be uh, bonded out okay. and if you could just put that on a document and sure. just send it give, give it forward it to the City Council to give it to Mary Medora's office I, we, I think we'd all appreciate it sure I would, that way, when constituents will ask us about this, we can we'll have something to give them. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? No. Move to approve. Uh, so the motion's already been made and seconded. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, all all right. those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that's recommended. Um, Susan, are you coming to give us any financial updates? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a blessedly short finance committee. Uh, no new business. Okay. Uh, move to adjourn, please. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjourning finance? Aye. 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 All right. We're back into the regular meeting. Well, look at that. <clears throat> Moving right along. Thank you all very much, by the way. We're up to um, street acceptance, the petition for Pine Valley Road. It's a, to refer to the Planning Board and the Board of, Board of Public Works. And when I have your uh, Chair, petition. Thank you. Go ahead. Can council. we take these as a group, please? Does the council want to take these as a group? These are being referred, correct? Yes. 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 Well, yes the Finance Committee. Well, they're all straight. Group refer as a group. Second. <coughs> all those, uh, Council Freeman. Why are these being referred to Planning Board? Uh, do you want to move to recognize Wayne Fiden? I move to recognize Wayne Fiden. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, it's required. I can't tell you if it's required by statute or by your by the ordinance, but it is definitely required. It's by ordinance, says Mary. <coughs> Put that four-person board on that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion on moving these as a group? No. All those in favor of moving these through the uh, referring these to the planning board as a group, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. We're moving at breakneck speed. Uh, next, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, it's almost like he's here, uh, ordered that the Northampton City Council approves for fiscal year 2013 a residential factor of one and the enclosed tax levy percentages. Move to approve. Second. Second it. Discussion. Yeah. Council Freeman Daniels, you look like you want. To I was just when you said tax levy percentages. Uh, the enclosed is the reference to the recommendations of Joan Serafin. Is that yes. Right? Okay. That's all. Any other discussion? Setting the tax rate. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Uh, and okay, this will be coming up for a second reading. But the, all those opposed, abstentions. Thank you. Yeah, this this is come, this come before you for a second reading at the next meeting. <clears throat> next, uh, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, uh, and this is the. Do you guys want me to read this again? This is the Chapter Thirty B. Let's skip. This. Wave reading. Wave reading. Wave reading. Yeah. We want to amend. And uh, do you now I would entertain an amendment for to change so the terms from five, and half years, it. five years to five and a half? All those in favor of amending the language of the, the length of term here? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, now uh, accepting. Um, move to a, move the amendment. amendment. So with that, the amendment's done as amended. Okay. The, okay. All those in Wait. Yes. So this is, I just want to clarify. This software 
expenditure is being overseen by the school committee of the Smith Vocational School. We have to allow them to enter into a contract that's five years, that's above three years. I understand I'm, getting the, I'm getting the nod. All right, so there's another body that's overseeing this contract. We're just letting them go beyond what, what ordinarily would be. I just want to make sure that there's an additional layer of oversight here. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? And that's going to come back next meeting as well for a second reading. Next, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Community Preservation Committee, do you guys want to waive the reading? Wave Please the waive the reading. <laughs> second. Oh, come on. I could do it in iambic pentameter if you'd like. And it's sort of I'd like to hear that. <laughs> Draw my <Jeez>. second. <laughs> uh, uh, there is a motion? Yes. To approve. Second. All right. Sure, again. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. This comes back for second reading as well. This is in second reading. Uh, on the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee, ordered that the following sums, account $6,340457, unexpended amount originally appropriated for new equipment for the sewer department, $2,769.77, unexpended amount originally appropriated for the wastewater treatment plant modifications, and $19,726.67 unexpended amount originally appropriated for the wastewater treatment plant modifications, total funds of $37,166.08 to be reprogrammed and transferred into an account to be used toward purchase and maintenance and repair of equipment at the wastewater treatment I'm plant. Sorry, I to approve. That's the wrong one. I'm sorry. It's out of order. You guys enjoy my reading of that? Remember, is that, is that out of order? <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to move? Uh, the, enjoy your charm, yeah. Bill. We'll take it. We'll, out of order. Yeah, we'll take, take it out, it out of order. order. Move that out of order. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Just went through the right. effort of reading it. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a motion? I said move to approve. I'll second. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. Is this? It's not a second. Oh, well, a second this is reading. our second, second reading. reading. I was here. Is this for re the repair of the facility that was damaged during the flood? Is that what we're talking about? That's what I recall from the. Yeah, from when the I wasn't here for the. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You weren't here. Yeah. yeah. Ned yeah. gave a long. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that. Fine. If you guys have already hashed You'll this out, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor in the second reading? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Okay, now here, out of order, on the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee, ordered that the following sums, $17,698.51, unexpended amount originally uh, appropriated for phase five of the landfill project for engineering and permitting, $40,598.92, unexpended amount originally appropriated for phase five of the landfill project for expansion, $29,955.99 unexpended amount originally appropriated for phase four of the landfill project for improvements, the total funds being $88,253.42 to be reprogrammed and transferred into an account to be used towards the costs involved in decommissioning of the solid waste landfill leachate plant. Move to approve it. Second. Second. Any discussion in the second meeting? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. That's the final. That's that. okay. Also in second reading, upon the recommendation of the Mayor and the Finance Committee, order that the following sums, $2,987.77 unexpended amount originally appropriated for sewer work, $4,506.86 unexpended amount originally appropriated for the Elm Street drainage repair, and the total funds being $7,494.63 to be reprogrammed and transferred into an account to be used towards storm drain work on Sylvester Road. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Council Premier Gaines. So most of these orders are reprogramming old funds, and uh, I do hope that uh, the mayor and uh, finance director can 
find the rest of the uh, unspent but allocated funds so that we can uh, have a real true assessment of, of uh, what needs what kind of work has been completed and what uh, what new priorities we can assign these these uh, these funds for and um, possibly hopefully seeing that in the next few months uh, is something that I'd like to have happen would you like to recognize Susan Wright and ask her how it's going I no? uh, if if no one's desirous to speak then I don't want to put anyone on the spot just say that I as we've discussed before we are doing that and um, we, we actually will be um, bringing forward some other similar orders very soon to do similar reallocations where we've identified unspent um, borrowing authority or in some cases money that's already been borrowed and there's tailing so we are committed to doing that and um, particularly trying to put together a capital plan so we will we want to make sure we have all available capital resources so can I since you did uh, step up. It, is it the case that uh, if it's if the money is just put into uh, if if on if money that's been allocated is then put it, if it's not reprogrammed immediately but put put into um, the free cash or something does it does it go away because it has been certified? Is there some problem with that? So it has to be reprogrammed rather than uh, it's more about when we when we borrow and we um, you know, the borrowing is often based on an authorization from the council. And so, uh, in the case here, you bar the authorization was you know and there was for the storm drain projects, and uh, we now want to use change the, uh, the use of that. So that's why we're moving it to this new purpose to finish off this Sylvester Road project. Um, I don't know that it necessarily reverts to free cash once we've already borrowed and, no. and authorized the money so Bor borrowed money has to be used for a purpose for which it was originally borrowed. Yeah. for the same length of time and the same type of purpose you can't mm -hmm. put borrowed money back into the general fund mm -hmm. and, and what about fund that funds that weren't borrowed that were just allocated but never spent because some of that is here as well if I'm not mistaken you should step up Susan, thank you. Yeah. yeah for the public so money that begins with when you see the account number 3,000, that's borrowed money. Money that begins with the number 19303 is cash capital. That could be re that could be sent back to the general fund. That could be sent back to free cash. Um, money that begins with 6,000, which a couple of these orders do, that's that's money in one of the enterprise funds, and that has to remain within the enterprise fund. But it could be released from its purpose and put back into the free cash of that particular enterprise fund. Could you, for Councilor Tacey's benefit, Thank you. who was not here at the last meeting, explain how we came upon these monies, the, the, how you, the, should uh, Councilor Tacey, the, uh, through the diligence of Susan Wright and the mayor, they've actually, they're finding dormant money, for lack of a better term, maybe you could have a better phrase for it. But. It's not really found money. It's every year at the end of the fiscal year, every department head has to, re has to submit a form for every existing capital project to say whether they want those funds carried forward. So these are not found monies. These are monies that have been carried forward. It's just the, the, the mayor, the mayor's position is that these monies need to be put to work um, rather than sit there. So we're moving these monies into projects that are active rather than let them sit there for projects that have become dormant because the project's original purpose is either completed or, or not necessary anymore. So it's not money that we didn't know about. This is money we've always known about. We're just making a conscious management decision to use that money and put it to work. We had found money sitting in uh, capital improvements over the years, like in, in parking that sat there for five or six years that never got used. And so this is all part of the same process. And I, I know this isn't the first time we've, we've found some of this and done this in the last several months. I, we've continued to find. Again, not f I think it is important to emphasize not found because these are all, right. this is all on the books. What happens is projects sometimes take multiple years, yeah. so we carry that money forward. But at a certain point, if a project's either not going to go forward or it's been done and there's tailings left, we should just reallocate that money and use it for That's other true. projects that are worthy. So we're just trying to really make sure that we're managing that going forward. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Okay. This is in the first reading. Uh, on the recommendation of the Planning Board and the Historic Commission, ordered that whereas the Clark School campus contains a rich architectural and human history, and whereas Opal Real Estate Group and Historic Round Hill Summit LLC have an agreement with Clark School to purchase the majority of the campus for redevelopment, and whereas the Planning Board has issued a site plan approval for such redevelopment, and whereas said redevelopment is consistent with the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan, will preserve the historic buildings and campus and will create needed housing and economic development within walking distance of downtown. And whereas, in, in accordance with the incentives in Northampton zoning and an offer by Oakland Real Estate Group, the site plan approval requires that a historic preservation restriction be, replaced, be placed on the redevelopment, redeveloped portion of the campus. And whereas, in a public hearing, and public meeting, respectively, the Planning Board and the Historical Commission have approved the historic preservation restriction. And now, therefore, be it ordered further, the City Council authorized the City of Northampton, acting through its mayor and historical <coughs> to accept the preservation restriction as defined by Mass General Law Chapter 184, Section 31, on said land for historic preservation purposes. So moved. Second it. And I would like to recognize Wayne Biden. Second that. All those in favor of recognizing Wayne Biden? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. So short version, if you remember, City Council passed zoning six or eight months ago, which created an incentive for the reuse of historical buildings. So Opal could have developed all of the Clark School buildings they're buying in accordance with the zoning, and if they ever wanted to, to tear down any buildings up there. The new zoning says we're going to give you some additional uses to create a financial incentive to save the buildings but only if you're willing to guarantee the buildings will stay up forever. Um, and so based on that section of zoning, Planning Board approved Opal's project about three weeks ago. Um, and this is their that next step is, okay, they've now guaranteed to preserve the buildings forever. The mechanism for doing that is to put a historic preservation restriction on the buildings. So this was amicable with everybody? Was it um, the developer and yeah, just curious? Certainly amicable with the developer, certainly amicable with the planning board. I think the neighborhood, frankly, is split. I think they love saving the historical buildings. Um, they like the some reuse. They're worried about the amount of traffic the project will generate. No, so I get, a lot, I get a lot of calls about the traffic. Right, right. So except for the traffic, yes, I think it's amicable. That's I, I think in terms of, of this, of the hist I, I think there definitely is concern about the traffic. I think in terms of the historic preservation exactly. piece that we're discussing, I don't Perfect. think there was much opposition to that, and I think the neighborhood wanted this exactly. to be there. I think the, the only opposition was if Opal hadn't, the reason we, we didn't come forward earlier, correct me if I'm wrong, was that there was, uh, Clark School was not too happy about having a historic preservation. If Opal had not purchased this, that would have limited who might have come in. Is that correct? That, that's correct, but remember there's two steps you're going to see. These are historic preservation restrictions. It's a voluntary agreement. I mean, it's, it's, it's in perpetuity. It would no longer be voluntary once they sign this, but they wouldn't have had to sign this. We don't have the right to mandate yeah. someone to give us property. Right. So these go with each building. So these don't protect the grounds, just the buildings. We still expect to come back before you all in January and February to expand what's now the Elm Street Historic District will become the Elm Street Round Hill Historic District. Um, and that will be in, in January or February, and that's exactly what, what Council Specter said as well. And, but my reason for the question was was the atmosphere, and what, I didn't attend the meetings. The atmosphere in which it was it was an arm twisting on their part or arm twisting on our part, or was it just amicable? Uh, well, I'll give you my opinion. I think in terms of having these two steps with the historic process, I think there was general agreement. I think there are some concerns if you're talking about traffic, but that's a different. No, I'm not talking about traffic. Okay. Just, so in terms just of the uh, atmosphere of the agreement. Yes. Uh, I think yes. I think yeah. the answer is yes. Yeah. This okay. I, I think there are some people in the neighborhood who would have also liked this to cover trees and landscaping, and that we don't have the right to do. That's yeah. correct. Exactly. And I, I think in the end they all agreed to it. Several, two members came to the historical commission, and there was a good discussion in the end. They said, we understand where our concerns are, yeah. are relayed. But. So, so between the city of Northampton and the developer, you work together to – Yes. To make this work. Yes. And the atmosphere was good. Okay, yes, that's absolutely. all I needed to know. It might be, 
can, can I make one more? Uh, uh, Councilor Spector and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. Just so you understand, the, the developer in this case is applying for very for federal historic grants, is that correct? Right. So that this particular developer, yes, because they're actually applying for things that require them to uh, have a historic uh, nature to the property. Um, so if anything, there would have been, as, as I think uh, Wayne is pointing out, if anything, folks would have liked to have seen this stronger, but we didn't have the, the, uh, the we can't do that. Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Uh, is it? I wish someone from Mobile were here. They they signed. They've they've agreed to this through the site plan approval process. That's, That's correct. correct. So here's a hypothetical question: What if Opal is unable to secure financing or has enough construction delays where they go out of business and they have to sell the property? The, the historic preservation continued. The restriction continues with their sale of it. That's, That's correct. Now the so timing, of course, is. Opal or the LLC they're setting up will be the one granting this. They don't yet own the property. So if that bad thing happens and they never execute the deal, this wouldn't be in effect. So what you're giving us authority for is to actually accept the historic preservation restriction. We won't accept it. We can't accept it until they actually sell the property until. Right. So, but I, I, thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, understand though that this would if Opal, Opal has a specific plan that if, if it doesn't happen, the historic preservation restriction could be a significant albatross when trying, when trying to market this property uh, to any other kind of developer. Is that correct? I, I think that's correct. It's only why Clark School was very concerned about this. I, I think the reason Opal is not concerned about that is this has been a year and a half process. They're not taking title to the checked off everything in the process. So they're not taking title to their confidence that it doesn't happen. The, the reality is if they sold the property and this depreciated the value, their basis in the property would be less. They'd be selling it for less than they bought it for. So in essence, they'd be, their subsidy would be making the historic preservation possible. Right, well it's a bad deal for them, but it's also not a great deal for the city because now we have abandoned buildings on Round Hill Road. Right. I mean. It, it, all that's true. If if Opal failed to deliver, that's that's absolutely true. That it would be harder for the next developer to tear down the buildings. That's what this is all about. But Opal is the one who's taking that financial risk. They're saying we think the permits add so much value to the property that the buildings with historic preservation restriction, which you're right, to pre lowers the value, plus the permits from the planning board, overall nets more value to them. Thank you. I, I just I'll speak then uh, in general. I, I'm I have hesitation about uh, issuing this authority until uh, I hear from. Well, I I actually don't know. I mean, I'd like to see the ground get broken before before really they put a historic preservation because anything can happen between now. I mean, as we saw with with the hotel property, for instance, anything can happen between now and when the actual uh, develop redevelopment takes place, and if there's a historic restriction on it, it could, it could really make that property much harder to market. Thank you. Well, we've, we've been through this, um, and I think your point is well taken. I think, however, person right now, if, if uh, Opal were to back out, that the, the um, first of all, if Opal backs out right now, as you said, this won't go into effect. But for one thing, the, the neighborhood very much wants this in effect. And wants to preserve the nature of, uh, of this area. And, and I'm grateful, I think there are some problems, but I think most neighbors are grateful that Opal is gonna come in and preserve uh, an area that is very unique and very close to the city. So this is something that the neighborhood wants very strongly, and so I'm gonna back it. And, um, and Clark School has been, you know, all along has, has, has been the one holding the bag on this, that they didn't want this to go through. Um, until they were assured that that Opal was going to move forward. So um, I hear your concerns, but they've been discussed a great deal, and I, I feel pretty confident at this point to move this forward. If I may, Wayne, um, historically this has been, uh, the neighborhood has been divided, as has been pointed out, and um, if there was a contingent of it, 
the neighborhood that was so uh, that if, that have expressed some resistance to uh, or some disapproval of Opal being the developer or able to put up obstacles that would prevent them from or proceeding to the point where they feel that it's within their economic interest, then the the scenario that Councillor Freeman Daniels paints is problematic for the for the community. If I could say else in terms of why the timing is critical and why I think Opal hopes you go forward in this piece, is I think there's a separate risk from Opal's standpoint. Um, you all approve the historic preservation restriction. It then has to be approved by the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and that can be a frustratingly slow process. So I think from Opal's standpoint, taking title to the property and then having to wait for a approval process would really scare them. Because at this point, they have no carrying costs. Once they have a carrying cost, they'd like to go quickly. And so that's the reason we're trying to move forward in, in good faith to get the approvals. Because that, you know, in terms of the carrying costs would kill projects, frankly. So I, th I think that's why they're hopeful we're going forward. Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with Councilor Spector. There have been many hearings on this. I think the developer has worked very well with the neighbors. And I think by putting this um, historic preservation in that site is one of the best things that could happen there. The buildings are just absolutely beautiful. So I think the voices of the residents are value here and also with the builder working with the residents in the city. I'm going to support it. Councilor Tacey? Yeah, you were right in my head when you brought up the hotel. But it, um, but we don't own, we own the property here. We do not own the Clark School campus. But the, I'd hate to see the buildings, if this fell apart, be abandoned. Um, we know what happens to abandoned buildings. Look at the Northampton Nursing Home. So, but anyway, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna support it, and I'm gonna hope that uh, it all goes well. Um, you don't know, uh, and like we, uh, traffic concerns of that doesn't play into this but they are beautiful buildings and uh, I know the neighbors on Crescent Street had actually tried to buy or tried to purchase that piece behind their homes and it didn't work out so well you know that very well yeah. uh, it's, it's in your ward so uh, I'm, I'm gonna support it but I am I'm a little leery um, of whether or not all of this actually happens the way we think it'll happen I hope it does so I'm going to support it, um, and I, I wish Opal and Clark School the best of luck. But uh, I've got reservations. Council Lubar. Yes, Wayne, we are in dire need of housing. Would this be affordable housing? This or? would not be affordable housing. Okay. These are they're 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 rental housing. They're expecting to be the high end of the market. Okay. If I could add one other point to, to Councilor Tacey's point, which is I you know, I really think. You all should be proud of the zoning that you passed a few months ago for exactly that point. I think had the only option been the housing that was allowed on the site, you would have run a much greater, greater risk of buildings being empty. This is sort of the, the carrot and the stick, the, the stick being we have to put historic preservation restriction. But you've now, because the zoning that you've passed, you've now given them far more options for redeveloping the property. And so the likelihood of the building's not finding an end user is much lower. Certainly never zero, but much lower. So let me just, can I just follow up on that point? His, this maybe it's maybe it's I'm, partially my reservations are I don't exactly understand a preservation restriction here. Um, how would that in, how that obviously the zoning that we passed allowed for much greater use and density uh, of given as long as the exterior facades and so on of the of the existing structures were preserved. How does that play? How, what's the interplay between that and a historic preservation restriction? So historic preservation restriction is, in essence, a permanent agreement. I mean, nothing prevents hurricanes and tornadoes. But assuming the buildings don't have calamity, it guarantees those buildings remain well beyond what some zoning could be in the future. So it's a, it's a permanent commitment. It doesn't cover the gymnasium because it's not a historical building. But all the other buildings are protected. It's only protecting the outside shell of the building. So this has nothing to do with use. Use will evolve as market demands evolve. So they can always change the use of the building. So, so what you're saying is that it's similar to the kind of zoning that we, uh, that, that, that OPA will be taking advantage of. 
That's correct. At, at, as far as preserving the exterior and many of this, many of the architectural features, but being able to reorganize the inside. That's correct. Okay. I, I thank you. That was very helpful. Um, and I, <laughs> it's nice to get something, a letter or something from Opal saying that they're very, that they they have a, a good uh, plan. But I think that it's it's been ha had in lower committees and and with the with the from the planning board. So, that's, yeah. consultation. The outside shell, but that's not in its entirety. It's what you view from the street in passing. Is that correct? Historic preservation restriction is the entire shell. You're at what you're thinking of as a historic district. A historic district only preserves things from the road. Historic preservation restriction does include the entire shell. But it doesn't mean you can never do a change. It just creates a process. So they need to do a roof penetration, for example, for a new smokestack, or they need to do an expansion of the building. They have to come before the Historical Commission for approval, and there's a clear criteria for doing it. So it doesn't mean no change. It just means we get to review that change. OK, so, so let me um, expand on my initial question um, about the atmosphere. I, I had asked about Opal in the city. What about Clark School? Clark School is very happy. They, you know, Clark School is only very happy. Yeah, they're only you know, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Council Freeman Daniel's concern. I understand. If the deal falls apart, <laughs> Clark School is very unhappy. But at this point, they're they couldn't be happier. Exactly. So Opal has a track record that you looked at of of this type of development. Um, the principals in Opal have a long track record. Opal's a relatively new firm. They're doing some projects. They're doing some housing in downtown Westfield. For Westfield State, they're doing a project in Springfield, but it's a, sh it's a relatively short track record under the term Opal. Uh, Peter Picnelli has obviously done a lot of development projects in the Springfield area. Um, we just had a ribbon cutting today at the State Hospital for a project which Opal is going to be owning on the corner of Village Hill Road and Route 66. So they're clearly a player in, in a lot of different projects. Okay, so should we pass this then? If the deal with Opal falls apart, this is in place. This won't be signed. If Opal doesn't take title to the property, this won't be signed. So you're authorizing the mayor to accept this. That lets us then go to Mass Historic Commission and get them to agree to approve this. But the actual signing won't happen until Historic Round Hill Summit LLC actually takes title to the property. And how long? I don't know. They, so they believe soon. I mean, possibly by the end of the year, but I don't know. So our approval of this or tonight, or acceptance, or whatever you want to, um, it, it doesn't automatically put this in place. That's correct. It authorizes us to accept it, which lets us go to the state and get their approval. The signature won't actually happen until probably five minutes after Opal takes title to the property. So Clark School will not be bound by this That's reservation correct. if that deal falls apart. I just want to make that ex yes. really clear. Yes, it's absolutely correct. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Any other discussion? All right. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, this is going to require a roll call vote. So. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Freeman? Yes. Councilor Daniels? Yes. Councilor Freeman? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Freeman? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Freeman? Yes. Councilor Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we have, uh, I believe, successfully prosecuted our first. Yeah, was there any new business? To oh, rushes. Yes, uh, not really new business. Did, did we talk about the holiday parade? No. Appointments? If you want to do those as an announcement? Yes. I'd like to make an announcement. The holiday parade, November 24th, starts at... The Trinity Park in Florence at 10 o'clock. And if you're going to. I don't know. I had it in front of me here a minute ago. I'm trying to think it out of my head here now without. I'm going to show up with my Santa. Who's got it? Somebody has it in front of them. Looking for it. Somebody has it in front of them. <laughs> anyway, it's at 10 o'clock, uh, November 24th. It starts at the Trinity Park. And it ends up uh, at the Florence Civic or the Michael Curtin. It's supposed to double loop and. Steps off at 10. Steps off at 10, says Councilor It's Saturday. always a ball. Saturday. Saturday. Saturday, yeah. It's, and it's, it's always a great time. Um, we always have a great turnout. Uh, and I just want to make sure everybody that knows that it is happening. Great opportunity to pick candy up off the street. Um, 
I thank you all. This is we. I would now entertain a, a motion for adjourn. move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you again. Thank you, Bill. Thank nice you. work, Bill. Good job. You did it. What did I do with that? No, I had it here. What did you, you do with that? Thank you.